Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's FOIA Advisory Committee meeting. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panel by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note all audio connections are muted and this conference is being recorded. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the session, which will be addressed at the Q&A part of the meeting. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and sent. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the meeting over to David Ferrio, Archivist of the United States. So please go ahead. Good morning and greetings from the National Archives Building on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. This Friday marks one year since the Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee last met in person in this majestic building. Elbow to elbow bumps and toe to toe taps replaced handshakes hinting at what would occur just one week later, sudden physical distancing that forced us to work from home, or as some say, live at work. These are interesting and difficult times for all of us. March 3rd marks the 150th anniversary of Congress passing legislation to reform civil service, creating a system in which civil servants are hired based on merit rather than politics. Today, there are roughly 5,000 full-time FOIA professionals across the government, civil servants and contractors, who work to administer and respond to FOIA requests without regard to politics. Their work is more challenging than ever in these times of misinformation, political division, and public health challenges. I want to thank the committee for working so diligently and thoughtfully to strive toward a FOIA process that works better for all FOIA processors and requesters alike. The committee today is exploring an idea that several committee members began discussing near the end of the third committee term, whether FOIA should apply to legislative and judicial branch records. There's no easy answer. Committee members, I appreciate your curiosity and thoughtful deliberation about this and other important FOIA matters. Finally, I'd like to invite all of you, committee members and the public, to the National Archives first virtual Sunshine Week event from 1 to 3 p.m. on Monday, March 15th. Please sign up via Eventbrite or tune in to our NARA YouTube channel. Senior U.S. District Court Judge Royce Lambert and friend of the National Archives will headline the program. Judge Lambert is no stranger to FOIA having ruled in hundreds of cases related to FOIA over the years and we're delighted that he's joining us to observe Sunshine Week, an annual nationwide celebration to access public information. Our event also will feature a panel titled U.S. Just this U.S. Transparency Landscape. Where do we go from here? FOIA Advisor, Advisory Committee Alexander Perloff Giles is one of the panelists. Details are at archives.gov slash OGIS. I hope to see you there. Please continue to take care and stay safe. And I now turn the meeting over to committee's chairperson, Alina Simo. Thank you. Great. Neva, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here. And if you can stay around for a little bit, that would be great. If not, um, we I will, have a really busy day. I will be in and out. Okay, terrific. Um, Good morning, everyone. As the Director of the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS, and, and this committee's chairperson, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the third meeting of the fourth term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. I hope everyone who is joining us today has been staying safe, healthy, and well. I would like to reintroduce to everyone the committee's designated federal officer, DFO, Kirsten Mitchell. Uh, Kirsten, are you waving? Thank you. She's going to help me stay on track today, as she always does and um, I look forward to a great meeting today. I want to welcome all of our committee members, express my gratitude for your continued commitment to studying the current FOIA landscape and developing consensus recommendations for improving the administration of FOIA across the federal government. Uh, we are all here today, except for Linda Fry from Social Security Administration. She cannot be here today, but hopefully she will be joining us next time. 
uh, and Kirsten has advised me that we can dispense with the roll call. So I'm just saying a hello to everyone. Uh, we, we definitely have a quorum, so that's all good. I also want to welcome our colleagues and friends from the FOIA community and elsewhere who are watching us today either via WebEx or in a bit delayed fashion, NARA's YouTube channel. We have a busy agenda today, as we always do, so I will do my best to make sure we stay on track so we can end on time. Uh, and despite today's ambitious agenda, we will leave time at the end for public comments, and we look forward to hearing from any non-committee participants who have ideas or comments to share. We will open up our telephone lines for the last 15 minutes of our meeting today. OGIS staff is monitoring WebEx and YouTube chat, so feel free to chat at any time if you have questions or comments. You may also submit public comments, suggestions, and feedback at any time by emailing FOIA-advisory-committee at nara.gov, and we will post them on the OGIS website. So some housekeeping rules for today. Uh, meeting materials for this term, along with members' names, affiliations, and biographies, are available on the committee's webpage. Click on the link for the 2020-2022 FOIA Advisory Committee on the OGIS website. Please also visit our website for today's agenda. We will upload a transcript and video of this meeting as soon as they become available. And all submitted comments will also be posted on our website. A reminder that the FOIA Advisory Committee is not the appropriate venue for concerns about individual FOIA requests. If you need OGIS assistance, you may request it by sending us an email at OGIS at NARA.gov, but we ask that you do not do so through our committee's email. Since March of 2020, this committee has met virtually a few times now, so we're getting better and better at it. Uh, the virtual environment has uh, many advantages, as we're all learning, um, including what I keep referring to as business on top and a little party on the bottom. Um, and the disadvantage for me, however, uh, for me and Kirsten, is that we're not always able to see committee members raising their hands or eagerly leaning forward to ask a question or make a comment as we would normally if we were all in the McGowan Theater. So I will be doing my best to monitor committee members' nonverbal cues during the webcast, uh, but don't be shy. Uh, send us a chat or just you know, violently um, express yourselves with hands or standing up or down if you want to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, but please be respectful of one another. Uh, try not to speak over one another, uh, although I realize that sometimes is inevitable. Uh, I do want to encourage committee members to use the all panelists option from the drop down menu in the chat function if you uh, want to be recognized, uh, or you can chat me and Kirsten directly. But please, in order to co comply with the Federal Advisory Committee Act, uh, please keep any communications in the chat function to only housekeeping and procedural matters. No substantive comments should be made in the chat function, as they will not be recorded in the transcript of this meeting. If you do need to take a break, uh, which is understandable, please do not disconnect from either audio or video of the web event. Instead, put your phone on mute and just simply close your camera. Uh, send a quick chat to me and Kirsten to let us know if you'll be gone for more than a few minutes and join us again as soon as you can. We have noted a 15 minute break at 11 a.m. on our agenda. Uh, we may break a bit earlier or a bit later, uh, depending on our pace today, but we'll definitely give everyone a break. And uh, an important reminder, please identify yourself by name and affiliation each time you speak. I know it's hard to remember that. I often forget that as well, so I'm equally guilty, but it does help us down the road with both the transcript and the minutes. And uh, Kimberly Reed, who is helping us out, um, our National Archives colleague, is um, going to express gratitude for that, I'm sure. Um, all of the aforementioned and transcript and minutes that I mentioned will be posted on the website are all required by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. So the first thing I want to turn to is to approve our meeting minutes from December 10th, uh, or 2020, our last meeting. Uh, but let me just pause for a second uh, before I go on to the minutes. Does anyone have any questions so far? Is everyone pathetic? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone violently raising their hands. Okay. Um, so let's turn to the minutes. I did email them to everyone earlier this week. I 
pretended to be Kirsten. I failed miserably. I did not change the subject line of my email to Wednesday instead of Thursday, so I probably confused some people, but in any event, I did circulate them. I hope everyone has had a chance to look at them. Um, Kirsten and I will certify the minutes uh, later today to be accurate and complete, which we're required to do under the Federal Advisory Committee Act within 90 days of our last meeting. Um, does anyone have any concerns, comments, questions about the minutes? Um, yes, right here. Kind of. James. Yes, yes, please. Sorry, let me just uh, say that on, and perhaps I should just put this in writing, but on page eight, I think under the summary, there may be a possible mistake uh, where it says, uh, sorry, excuse me, top of page nine, says the second item is how agencies can proactively classify documents to better meet the needs of the community. I think that should be declassified documents. Okay. So um, that's one, and uh, I could check with uh, Kristen about this, but uh, it's probably, that's, that was the item that we were considering looking at at the time. Okay. Duly noted. Kirsten, we got that right. Yes, we have made that change. Thank you, James. Is there anything else that we missed? Okay. All right, great. This is exactly why we ask everyone to look, so we want to make sure they're accurate. Uh, so other than that change, we, which we are now making, uh, that James just suggested, um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes in their form with the change that James just asked for? This is Tuan, I so move. Thank you, Tuan. Do I have a second? Second. James, thank you for the second. Um, all present in, uh, per, uh, in person, virtually, to, uh, are in favor of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Okay, is there anyone opposed? No opposition heard. The minutes are approved. Uh, we will make that change, James suggested, and we will post those online um, as soon as we can. So before we turn to the next agenda item uh, on our agenda today, the subcommittee report, um, I have just a quick, uh, quick update or two. Since we last met on December 10th, we have advanced several prior FOIA Advisory Committee recommendations and updated our committee recommendations tracker accordingly. So hopefully Mr. Ferriero is hearing this and is excited about the fact that we're making some progress. Um, earlier this calendar year, uh, my OGIS team launched five cross-training programs in which professionals from other National Archives offices are assigned to OGIS on a part-time basis to work on completing past FOIA Advisory Committee recommendations. So we're very excited about that. The projects include compiling briefing material for new senior leaders, working with the Office of Information Policy and NARA's records management experts on updated training material, reviewing information agencies make available on their websites about the FOIA filing process, and reviewing agency performance plans to see if FOIA is uh, included as a criteria. In the interest of time, I won't mention other updates, but I do want to encourage everyone to check our dashboard on our website. We're very excited to have previewed our dashboard and, and keep it up and running, and we're going to be updating it um, as, as needed. So um, please stay tuned for updates. Um, and just a quick thank you to all of our cross trainees, um, and we really are very grateful for all of their help. So we are right now at almost 10.20 a.m., uh, I think we're two minutes early, but uh, I am now ready to turn to our subcommittee reports for today. We will hear from each of our four subcommittees. I do want to point out that we have recently posted mission statements for all four of our subcommittees, classification, legislation, technology, and process. They're all available on our main OGIS webpage. If you scroll down to what's new, you will see them all there. Um, so thank you very much to all four subcommittees for getting your mission statements finalized and, um, and approved by your subcommittees. I am very grateful for that. So any questions before we proceed to hear from our subcommittees? Oh, no questions. Okay, everyone looks excited. Great. Okay, so first on the agenda is the process subcommittee. Uh, Michael, unfortunately, you don't have Linda with you today, but I know you're going to do a great job of giving us an update on the work of your subcommittee. So, Michael, over to you. Yeah, um, thanks so much, and I, I'm very excited because it's perfect timing. I just finished my breakfast, but 
Uh, we've had a really, really wonderful group of, of folks from both the requester and the processing community on the FOIA advisory uh, process subcommittee. What we're really investigating is the implementation and impact of prior recommendations to kind of start things off. Uh, the FOIA advisory committee has been going on for a number of sessions now. Um, and so what we wanted to do was sort of see how previous recommendations had the impact that we hoped they would and sort of where, where can we steer our efforts to maximize uh, impact and, and positive reforms within the FOIA process for all the constituencies. Um, I do recommend checking out the OGIS dashboard, uh, which has been tracking the uh, implementation of prior recommendations. It's a really wonderful uh, uh, you know, resource, um, and it's been really helpful for us as a process subcommittee. It's been really great seeing all the ways that prior work has flowed through the creation of new processes, improved acknowledgement letters, and much, much more within the FOIA process. As part of our information gathering, uh, one of the things we're doing is we're coordinating with groups on a requester community survey that uh, we hope to go out during Sunshine Week to help get insights into what's the perception of these changes and what areas the requester community feels have not uh, seen improvements. We're also working on bringing in guest speakers to our subcommittee to hear about how other jurisdictions, including state and local jurisdictions within the United States, as well as the other international FOIA experience uh, and right to know experience uh, in other countries. We're also going to be inviting in some agencies that process requests so that as the process subcommittee, we can really understand sort of the internal life cycle of requests and identifying challenges that they have. Uh, we really want to make sure we include both large and small agencies because each agency has its own unique challenges and opportunities uh, for improving FOIA processes. We've also been really excited to coordinate with other subcommittees on a variety of key areas, such as the use of technology, uh, ways to think about litigation, and other areas where process kind of intersects with lots of different other subcommittee work. Um, some things that we could use your help on uh, whether you're another member of the advisory committee uh, or an attendee at today's session <coughs> from either the requester or the processor community. Uh, what questions do you think we should ask the FOIA requester community? Uh, we are trying to get this survey together in the next couple of weeks so that we can send it out and promote it during Sunshine Week. And we're really interested in what are some questions we can ask that can help highlight frustrations, challenges, and opportunities within the FOIA process. Our hope is that we can use these survey results to kind of guide us to make sure that we're processing on the most important, most impactful areas of the FOIA um, process, as well as helping uh, focus future reform efforts. Uh, one other thing we'd love is examples of uh, who gets the FOIA process right. Uh, we'd love to hear examples um, both within agencies that you, maybe you have interacted with in the past or maybe you've worked at it in the past, that had a really great FOIA process that left kind of everybody satisfied and, and built a healthy culture of transparency. Um, but we're also kind of interested in sort of uh, the international experience. So in other countries, what can we learn from their other laws? What can we learn from other processes uh, and setups? And so if you have, say, you know, know of other places that are doing public records and transparency really right, we'd love to hear those examples. Um, and then uh, we're also interested in sort of folks who, who've been kind of pushing for these reforms. Uh, maybe you're involved in kind of pitching or helping get a, a prior recommendation implemented. Um, and we'd love to kind of hear sort of reflections. I think one of the things is uh, on the requester community, I feel like there's not enough discussion about what has positively changed the last few years. Um, and so maybe that's because, uh, you know, FOIA requesters are just a, a pessimistic bunch that always wants more. Um, but also, uh, I'd love to kind of hear if, if you pushed for a change or you pushed for a, um, a prior recommendation and it was implemented and maybe it didn't kind of work out as, as you had hoped or you expected. That kind of feedback is something that we're really interested in and working on because we want to make sure that when we, as we do implement these changes, and there have been a ton of changes implemented over the last six years in the FOIA processes, are we actually addressing some of the root challenges within the FOIA process? And if other changes need to be made, we want to be making sure our, our recommendations are attuned to those. Um, so yeah, uh, it's been fantastic working with the rest of the process committee. Um, those are three areas we'd love to hear back more on, either during the open comment section or feel free to reach out to us uh, as subcommittee members.
Okay, great, Michael, thank you. Um, anyone else from the process subcommittee want to add anything? I just want to give everyone that opportunity. I'm seeing some no's, okay. Uh, any questions from other committee members for the process subcommittee? Any ideas for questions that uh, the process subcommittee should be including on their survey? Or if you're thinking about them, you can chat them later. Okay, I'm hearing some silence. All right, Michael, thank you so much for that report. We really appreciate it, and thank you for all the hard work. The uh, next on the agenda is the Technology Subcommittee, co-chairs Allison Dietrich and Jason Bart. I don't know who's presenting, Allison or Jason or both, but I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Jason, did you wanna start? Yeah, I can start, thank you. This is uh, Jason Gart. Um, so we're in the information gathering stage right now. Um, we're exploring the applicability of technical standards and best practice recommendations for federal agencies. Uh, with the end goal of ensuring that federal agencies have up-to-date access and impartial information on various technology solutions, um, right now, we're in the process of speaking with uh, points of contact at other agencies that have experience in technology selection process and also thinking through our final deliverable. So, um, Allison, I'm not sure, or other members, I'm not sure if I, I missed anything or if that covers it. I think that does a pretty good job. We're also just trying to make sure that uh, maybe have some end goals of what the technology for FOIA would look like but still trying to keep in mind the needs of the various sized agencies. Smaller agencies have different needs than larger agencies. That's it. Okay. That was really short. I was waiting for you guys to stretch it out to 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to ask anyone else on the technology subcommittee if they want to jump in and add anything. David Collier, you always have something to say. <laughs> okay, anyone else on the committee have questions for the technology subcommittee? Uh, hi, um, this, is, yeah. this is uh, Patricia Wath from NLRB. Um, I was just curious for the um, technology subcommittee, um, are, are you all working with the um, uh, the Chief FOIA Officer uh, Technology Council, or I guess they're actually their own technology council. I was just wondering if um, you all were, were communicating with them. Uh, Patricia, this is Allison from Commerce. Uh, yes, we have uh, the process uh, subcommittee and the technology subcommittee uh, wound up having a conversation with one of the members of the CFO Technology Committee a few weeks ago. So we're trying to uh, use them as a resource and not duplicate, figure out what they've been working on and what we can work on separately to not duplicate resources. Great. But also learn from each other as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other, Patricia, thanks for asking that question. I know I queued you up for it, so I'll thank you again <laughs> later. Um, anyone else want to ask any other questions? I actually had a question from Michael. In terms of your survey, are there other subcommittees that you're uh, partnering with? Uh, is technology subcommittee one of them, or uh, you're looking to other subcommittees to pair with? Uh, yeah, we, I've heard, I've gotten good feedback from other subcommittee members, uh, or other, other subcommittees, rather. Um, and, yeah, I think uh, our timeline is a little rushed because uh, got to put together a survey in the next week or so to get out ready for Sunshine Week, but I, I would love to kind of hear from other folks uh, who've got ideas and, and feedback, so please do reach out to me. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, well, thanks this very is, much for that, Allison. Jason, sorry, go ahead. This is Tuan. I was just uh, from the process subcommittee. I was going to add that uh, one thing that we've been talking about is the uh, possibility of more affirmative disclosure outside of FOIA, and uh, a technological solution would be necessary for, for some of that, trying to 
report databases and other things. And so I think we'll be having discussions uh, with uh, GSA's ATNF and, and uh, other uh, technology specialists, and perhaps uh, the technology subcommittee and process subcommittee will be uh, putting our heads together in the coming months. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. That's, that's a great idea. Okay. Um, somehow I've lost, I don't know why I'm not seeing Jason or Allison on my screen. Maybe they've just gone away. They're hiding, but I'm sure you guys are there. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that report. Uh, let me turn to the classification subcommittee next. Co-chairs James Stoker and Kristen Ellis. Uh, I don't know which one of you guys is going to go, but uh, this is James. It's, a, it's me. Okay. Hi, James. Hi. Right, good morning, everyone. The classification subcommittee has been very busy, as we are a small subcommittee. We're only meeting monthly, but our meetings have been very productive as we endeavor to address a very thorny set of problems. Um, uh, we have a mission statement like the other subcommittees. It's posted on the web, and I won't read it all here. Uh, but uh, the most important sentence is this one. Uh, the subcommittee will study the impact of classification on the FOIA process, the use of particular exemptions to justify the withholding of national security information, and ways to improve communication between agencies and the public regarding classification. So it's a pretty broad mission in regards to classification, and we've had to make some choices about how we're going to proceed. Our current area of, area of focus is the use of GLOMAR responses to FOIA requests. GLOMAR, as you will recall, is a form of response to FOIA requests that basically notes that the agency cannot confirm or deny the existence of records responsive to the request as this would reveal a fact that should not be revealed for whatever reason. From the perspective of the requester community, Goldmar responses are particularly unsatisfactory because not only do they fail to provide transparency, but they don't really provide any useful information uh, whatsoever. And so oftentimes these responses from the, from the uh, requester uh, perspective feel like a waste of time and resources. And yet from the perspective of agencies, the nature of their mission and operations means that GLOMAR responses are often necessary. There are many challenges associated with these. Uh, GLOMAR responses are often considered to be a sort of loophole in the FOIA, as they were not mentioned in the Freedom of Information Act itself, but rather developed over time as a matter of practice. They are also a black hole in the administration of the FOIA. As far as we can tell, no agency systematically tracks statistics regarding GLOMAR responses. There is a general perception that over time, the use of GLOMAR has expanded, but this is not backed up by, um, by statistical evidence. There also is a lack of understanding and communication between requesters and agencies over the best ways to avoid GLOMAR responses. And so our subcommittee aims to do two things. First, we want to collect publicly available documentation on GLOMAR uh, responses. And then second, to create a survey or questionnaire for certain agencies about their practices in using GLOMAR. Our focus will be on GLOMAR requests in in that are used in response to D1 security concerns, even though GLOMAR responses are used in a variety of other circumstances as well. So uh, in regards to collecting documents, I'd like to say thanks to Bobby Kalabian of the, of the Justice Department, who kindly pointed us towards uh, documents on their website, as well as to Michael Morrissey, who helped us to find some information on the Muckrock website as well. We are still looking for other forms of documentation, including agency-level uh, guides that, uh, that might explain how GLOMAR is used. And some of those we may get in response to our questionnaire. We're still in the process of drafting our questionnaire, but thus far it asks agencies to compile statistics on their use of GLOMAR, to share any procedures or guides for FOIA officers regarding GLOMAR and form templates that they use, um, and for examples of ways in which uh, requesters can pierce GLOMAR responses. Basically, we're trying to elicit best practices for requesters to avoid getting a GLOMAR response uh, to the extent possible. Other than the GLOMAR issue, we are looking at uh, some other issues associated with classification. We've discussed the idea of examining uh, drop dead dates for uh, classified documents. Uh, drop dead dates refer to a specific deadline uh, at which documents will automatically become uh, declassified. This is an idea with a very long history that uh, seems to emerge over and over as a possible solution to the problem of overclassification. 
but then uh, encounters again and again objections on grounds that it may not be appropriate for all kinds of documents. However, for the moment, I think we're going to concentrate primarily on Glomar because it's a, it's a pretty big issue and we still have quite a few things to work out. Uh, once we get a questionnaire developed and sent off to particular agencies, and we need to choose which agencies that's going to be, uh, we will turn our attention to other issues. Thanks, and I'll take any questions you might have about that. Yeah. This is Tom Sussman. I have a question. Uh, okay. James, uh, I, I, I know you, it's difficult enough to get information just about the cases uh, where Glomar was invoked. Uh, my early experience uh, was that the few courts willing to um, uh, reject a Glomar uh, defense nonetheless uh, find plenty of reasons not to provide any of the underlying documents to the requester. And I think that would be a, that would be an interesting element if you could dig slightly deeper. I don't think there are a lot of courts that have rejected uh, a Glomar defense. But when they do, if there's no release following that, that would be a, you know, an important um, a fact for, I think, requesters and litigators to know. This is James again. Tom, I think that's a, that's a very good idea. So you're suggesting looking into, in, into court records for cases where Glomar has, has been here, um, and that could be a really useful source of information for us. So uh, I'll make a note of that, and we'll discuss it in our, in our next meeting. Yeah, I had the first case, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'd love it if you share that for me and save me a search. I will. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kristen. I just want to check in with you as the co-chair. Anything else you wanted to add to James's excellent presentation? I do not have anything to add to James's excellent presentation. Thank you, James. All right. All right. Anyone else on the classification subcommittee want to add anything? Usually, Kel has something to say, but he might be in the process of logging back in. So um, I'm still here, but I don't have anything to add. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Just wanted to give you that opportunity since I can't see you. Uh, any other committee members have any other thoughts for the classification subcommittee? All right, Tom, this do you know this? I have nothing to add. Oh, Ludma, thanks. Thanks very much. Yes. Tom, do you know the site to your first case that you litigated? Uh, I'm, I'm just turning around to look <laughs> it up. I think I've got it here. All right, awesome. <laughs> Every little bit helps, thank you. Okay, so we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule. Everyone's going much faster than we anticipated. I don't have a really good stand-up act, but I'll try to have a little bit of filler. Um, but if, if everyone is okay, we'll move on to the fourth subcommittee's report, legislation subcommittee. Uh, Patricia Webb and Cal McClanahan are up as our co-chairs. Uh, Patricia and Cal, I don't know who's gonna be presenting. Um, I, I can start, and, and maybe Kel can back clean up for me. Um, Does that so work? The okay, great. Um, so the legislation subcommittee, we have um, four working groups. The one is expanding the scope of FOIA. The second is exploring ways to strengthen OGIS. The third is to look at funding for FOIA. And the fourth is FOIA fees. So we have these uh, four working groups. Uh, each, um, each group has a, has a team lead. And the folks in each working group have been conducting research and beginning to line up interviews. Um, one thing that Cal is uh, instrumental in, he's organizing meetings for the members of the legislation subcommittee with um, folks on the Hill um, to discuss the various legislative issues surrounding FOIA. Um, for the first working group, which is expanding the scope of FOIA, um, Tom Sussman is our team lead. He's just done a, a great job. Today he's organized two uh, phenomenal speakers for us to um, give us an education on uh, 
you know, the pros and cons of expanding the scope of FOIA. Because one of our goals for the legislation subcommittee is to, we hope, have a recommendation for this full committee uh, at the June meeting uh, regarding expanding the scope. But uh, Tom thought it best to lay the foundation and really uh, get some wonderful speakers in to kind of, as I said, lay the foundation for this. Um, Yeah, that's pretty much um, kind of kind of what we've been doing in a, in a nutshell. Um, I'll turn it over to Cal to to fill in anything that I've left off, and then welcome any of our legislation subcommittee members to share anything that they wish. And th thanks for that. That's a, I apologize to everybody listening. My computer is just not cooperating today, but I'm here. I'm not a cat. Um, yeah, that 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 hit the high point of uh, everything we're doing. The one thing that I would add is that some of our work is particularly timely right now because uh, we're not just looking at ways to re to reform FOIA through say, you know, passing a law that changes the law, but we're also looking at appropriations and uh, options. And it is appropriation season, and a lot of people are uh, engaged in sort of working with Congress to uh, get whatever they want into the various appropriations bill bills. And so with that, I would sort of reemphasize the call that other people have made of if anyone has particular ideas for, you know, ways that you think that you can improve uh, FOIA by reallocating money, whether it be just give more money to X office or something more creative like setting up a pilot program for something or uh, one of the ideas that some people have talked around, you know, creating a dedicated FOIA fund, stuff like that. We have the capacity to investigate things and to ask questions uh, that would allow us to maybe do more than people in the private sector could. So anybody has ideas uh, for things, that they, for targeted appropriations requests that would be related to FOIA that would be not just give more money to FOIA offices, uh, by all means, send them to us. We're open to ideas. We're, we're trying to find creative solutions to problems where just throwing more money at an office hasn't worked in the past. That's all. Sorry, I was, I'm not on video, so you can't see that I, I was I was done. But I'm done. In the, unless you have, anyone has any questions for either me or Patricia. Now, the, the only uh, this is Patricia Welp with NLRB. Um, uh, the other um, invitation that I, I'd like to send out to the full committee is if uh, you feel that the legislation subcommittee can can help your subcommittee in, in any ways, you know, please reach out to us and, you know, we'd love to work together. Yes, one of the things that's in our mission statement actually is the fact that we, we expect to overlap with everybody. And so if, if this works as designed, there will be cooperative efforts between us and pretty much every other subcommittee in the group. Okay. Patricia, were you going to cover the other three areas, or you just touched on them and you wanted to focus on the first area first, since that's the topic for today, really? Yeah, I just um, – I, I just wanted to kind of really highlight um, the first working group um, because that's um, that's where a lot of energy and effort has has been, and um, we are, as I said, our goal is to get a recommendation to the full committee um, by the next meeting in June, um, and so the other working groups are, you know doing what they need to do to, to get their recommendations together. But 
because um, last term, and, and you know, Tom can definitely speak to this, but because last term we visited this issue about ex expanding the scope of FLIA, um, but we really, it, it, it came up at the end of the term and we weren't really able to give it as much attention as it, it deserved. Um, and so that was one of the first uh, tasks that, that we decided to, to look at and, and um, you know, start to, to study and, and see if this is a, a possibility for a recommendation from this terms committee. Okay, got it. All right, Tom, anything you want to add? No. Not at this point, no. I'm, I'm saving my questions for our speakers who are excellent. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks. Actually, that's Kel, just so you know, I said Tom, but Kel, uh, thank you nope. for letting us know. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. And Tom shook his head no, so we're all good. Any other questions from our committee members about any of the four subcommittees? Anything else that you want to ask each other? This is a great opportunity to do so. Ms. Raja, I want to see if you have a question. Please. Uh, I'm curious about whether with regard to FOIA fees, is there any thoughts about getting rid of fees altogether for all requesters mm -hmm. and instead of having a cap on number of pages and if your, your request exceeds that cap, you pay a fee? Well, this is Kel McClanahan. I can say that while we're – our sort of legislative – focus on FOIA fees is in its infancy. That is something that we would be uh, looking at, at least the first half. I, I don't know that anyone has mentioned to us the idea of capping uh, requests, but there there has been in the requester community at least for a while an idea of, you know, how bad would it be if we just completely abolished FOIA fees altogether since they only raise like 1% of the expenses. And so that is one of the things that we expect to look into or b between that and more gradated responses. Uh, but uh, that's definitely something that I haven't heard before, and you should – I hate to give you homework, but, you know, if you, if you have a plan for that, definitely send it to us and we'll look at it. When I don't recall, Patricia, who's heading up our working group on fees, is okay. that um, – Alan, Alan is... Uh, Alan Bluffstein, yeah. So send, send him whatever you have, and I'm sure we'll get it into the hopper. Thank you. Uh, and I have another, this is Roger again from CDC. I have another question with regard to uh, legislation. So uh, the bulk of our requests that are received by federal agencies um, are received by DHS, and I would say the vast majority of them are probably faced by the requests. Um, is there... Any thoughts about specifically like looking at um, the area of first party requests with regard to agencies like USCIS or IRS that have um, specific either when it comes to the benefit side of the house or with um, removal proceedings, having basically mandated that agencies provide access to documents to first party requests outside of the FOIA process? So, for example, if somebody's in a removal proceeding, that agency, there should be a, a discovery process that they can take advantage of so they can get their documents without having to make a FOIA request. If that's mandated by law, that agencies would not, there'll be no delays and there'll be no need for, um, for, 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 for people in these proceedings or their attorneys to make FOIA requests for these documents. Um, Roger, this is Patricia West from NLRB. Uh, you make an excellent point, and uh, as a matter of fact, um, at the, the previous uh, committee's term, um, we touched upon that issue, and one of the recommendations um, was for agencies to try and find another uh, vehicle for first-party requesters to obtain the records. And in the report, I believe we give um, two examples of agencies that do that, that very thing, so that first-party requesters don't have to file FOIA requests for their own records. Um, for example, 
I believe we referenced uh, the IRS. You know, if you need a copy of your tax return, there's a, there's a different route that you can take instead of having to file a FOIA request to obtain those records. Um, another um, another uh, agency that, that has a vehicle for that is um, the Veterans Administration. They have a, um, a means by which uh, uh, veterans can obtain their own records, again, without having to file a FOIA request. So we did reference those um, in the recommendation last term. Um, and I do, I do think it's, um, it's really an important issue. I know for my agency, a good, a, a good chunk of our FOIA requests are first party requesters. Um, so if, if agencies can come up with another uh, way that folks can obtain their records without having to go through the FOIA um, process. I think it's a win-win. And this is Carol McClanahan. There, the idea of uh, even limiting it to people who are like in some sort of proceeding, like as you say, immigration proceedings, is also not without uh, precedent. Now, this is something that happens in security clearance cases all the time, where because if, when you appeal a security clearance decision, you have a right under the executive order to the investigative file, to the file that, that was compiled to you to support the allegation of the entity. Many agencies will just process that completely separately from FOIA, which is why you get records in you know, a month instead of you know three years. So there there are ample uh, possibilities of things that we could model such a thing off of. The sticking point might be though the idea of resources, and this is something that we would have to get into basically in the, the funding issue as well, where if an agency is basically giving reg giving faster access to this class of person, that's going to be a human being working in that agency processing that request instead of somebody else's request. And so there will be, a, the, I, I expect there will probably be a lot of pushback from someone like uh, USCIS or ICE uh, saying, well, we're already overworked and now you're telling us to go do these other things. We'll never get to the FOIA request. So that's something we're going to have to address as well. But I like the idea a lot. It's just going to be sort of a, a thorny, uh, thorny problem to, to solve. Okay. Thanks. Great discussion, everyone. Uh, Roger, you're good. Any other thoughts or questions? Um, just one, one more thought. Would you be with regards to, um, I, with regards to probably how? Other than just resources, probably using technology to properly um, assemble the documents. Uh, you know, so don't have uh, somebody's alien file dispersed among multiple agencies. Have a central repository where all the records are located, and make it easier to pull them. Uh, I think part of the problem is you have records dispersed, which is probably why it makes it difficult for them to collect them. But if they start making sure we have technology in place where an alien file which is supposed to contain all the records um, of, of, a, of a particular um, subject and all the encounters with the government in one central location and it's electronic, at least that would be a step in the right direction. This is Lubna from DIA. Yes, I, I just wonder. The, the class idea that Roger, you just mentioned, which from a practical perspective would be great. I wonder, does that raise any kind of Privacy Act issues from the idea that each agency collects information under different thorns and Privacy Act, you know, requirements? So I don't know if I'm going to say you hold it. I'm on another meeting, so. I heard him. Oh. You did hear him? Someone's got it. So um, 
not an area I'm, I'm intimately familiar with, but I just wonder whether that would be something to consider, um, you know, if, because each agency has different authorities and reasons for pulling certain information based on their SORN. So I wonder what, what issue, if any, that might create when you're trying to do a centralized uh, repository of all that information. Over. Lubna, thanks. Great point. Um, Roger, maybe this is uh, something you guys are already talking about in your first sure. party uh, request group, uh, working group, but uh, definitely a very important consideration. Um, any other lawyers want to chime in about SORN? Um, feel free. <laughs> it's uh, definitely not like my favorite area to talk about. Um, it's always sticky, but very important. So thank you for pointing that out, Lubna. Very helpful. Um, okay. This is, uh, yeah, this is Patricia West, uh, NLRB. Um, I didn't realize there, there was a first party um, working group um, that you're on, Roger. But one, um, one good resource for you might be um, Margaret Koka. Um, she we, we, has, actually, we, actually just, we actually spoke with her. Oh, did you? Oh, fantastic. Yes, we did. Okay. We did. Okay. We did. And we, we're going to have a conversation with Emily Creighton from American, oh, American Immigration okay. Council. Um, go, yeah. So okay. we have spoken with her. She was great. Oh, good. Okay. Ro excuse me, Roger, this is Bobby from OIG. Yep. Uh, another resource, uh, this year's Chief FOIA Officer report specifically asked agencies to report on um, an estimate of the first party request that they have, any alternative means that they're providing or, or uh, plan to provide. So that could give you some examples of um, how other agencies are handling it. So that, Bobby, do you commit to, to giving us a, a first uh, First, access to the document ahead of time so we can see it before you all, all, it's, yeah, it's all, all, the, all the CFO reports should be posted by Sunshine Week. So we'll okay. Have all, we'll have them all centrally uh, linked. Uh, sometimes okay. we have some stragglers, but we'll have them all centrally linked on our website. Awesome. And, of okay. course, we'll look at it ourselves, too, when we do our summary and assessment. But all the information will be publicly available as uh, agencies clear their reports. Um, but I wanted to make sure you knew that there was a specific question on this topic. Sure. And so there's already a good amount of resources that you can look to. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Bobby. I appreciate that. Okay. Just want to wrap up legislation subcommittee. Any other issues or questions oh. for Cal or Patricia? I'm hearing quiet. Actually, great segue before we take a quick break um, at 11 a.m. So we're actually back on schedule, which I really appreciate. Um, great segue about Sunshine Week. Uh, we have been featuring um, our, in our FOIA Ombudsman blog um, individual members of our committee. So I really want to encourage everyone to take a look. Um, this week's feature is our very own Tom Sussman. Uh, I actually enjoyed reading um, his, uh, his responses this week it was actually very interesting to learn some things about him that I did not know. Uh, we have previously featured uh, Roger, uh, David, uh, Alexandra, uh, Kristen, and um, in the last committee, we featured Michael Morrissey and Patricia West. So I think we're not going to uh, feature them again, if that's okay with them. Hopefully they're not insulted by that, but uh, we recommend everyone to look back to our blog posts from um, – from the last committee, and, uh, and you will learn more about Michael and Patricia. And um, uh, just want to quickly ask uh, about Sunshine Week. Are there any uh, events that anyone wants to share that uh, we should all be tuning into that are public in nature? Hi, Olina, this is Bobby. I was just, uh, our uh, department, the DOJ is planning to do its uh, annual Sunshine Week kickoff event on Monday. We posted about that on our blog post. Um, Michael had mentioned providing good examples of agencies. One thing we try to do is highlight some of the positive and great examples of agencies at this event and showing them as an example to other agencies. And we've had in the past one of my favorite uh, nominations from the requester community. So if there's, we just extend the deadline um, for nominations for 
the Department of Sunshine Board. So if there's, there is an agency that does it right in your view or there's a FOIA professional that you would like to recognize and highlight, I, I uh, encourage you to submit that nomination to us. Great, great. Uh, thanks so much, Bobby. Bobby, this is Patricia West from NLRB. I'm just curious, uh, does DOJ get many um, um, nominations from the requester community? We get them primarily from the agencies. We've had uh, from the requester community over the years, we had a couple. And uh, okay. of course, those are my favorite because uh, uh, we get it from the other perspective, of course, and um, mm -hmm. we don't get as many from the requester community. Right. Very interesting. Thank you. Great. Anyone else want to highlight any Sunshine Week events that we should all be tuning into? Tom, you're speaking, but you're on mute. See, okay. Uh, Tom Sussman, for those of you who are in the District of Columbia or surrounding, uh, may be interested in a program on the 18th at 1 o'clock on Zoom that will focus on um, uh, schools and policing and um, COVID in the District of Columbia. So it's a, about an hour and a half uh, program with two local council members and uh, other uh, uh, community activists and DC's very own o uh, OGIS, uh, the uh, director of the Office of Open Government will participate. So it's open, it's uh, to the public, uh, there's a uh, uh, a link for registering on dcogc.org, and uh, you're, you'd love to have a, a large audience. Great. Um, thank you so much. Alina, uh, this is Patricia West again. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, mention to um, the uh, folks who are uh, with agencies who are, who are listening, um, one of the recommendations from last term was um, uh, a suggestion about issuing an agency-wide memo um, to kind of educate the employees on the importance of FOIA. And uh, I think Sunshine Week is really a great time to do it. I know in the past OGIS has um, suggested that as a uh, as a recommendation themselves, and um, by way of example, they did that very thing at Sunshine Week, um, as did several other cabinet level agencies. So I'm just gonna throw it out there as a suggestion that um, folks may wanna have like their chief FOIA officer or a general counsel or, or at best, you know, the secretary of the agency to, to send out uh, such a memo agency-wide during Sunshine Week. Okay, great idea. And uh, Bobby and I will talk about this. It's on our to-do list, so thank you. We really uh, appreciate that suggestion. Okay, well, I think we're at 11.03 a.m. Uh, not hearing anyone else jumping up and down wanting to say anything. I suggest we take a 15-minute break. Uh, so let's come back at 11.18 a.m. and get ready with lots of questions for our two guest speakers. And uh, we can now take a break. Thanks, everyone.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Hope everyone had a great break and got some coffee. Uh, so we're ready to, to get started on the second part of our meeting today. And um, I am very pleased to welcome Daniel Schumann, the Policy Director for Demand Progress, and Michael, who goes by Mike, I understand, listener, the Executive Director of Free Law Project uh, to our committee meeting today. And I think we're all very much looking forward to their presentation. I just want to give the, uh, just a quick background on each of our speakers today. Uh, as Policy Director, Daniel leads Demand Progress and Demand Progress Education Fund's efforts on issues that concern government transparency, accountability, ethics, and reform, protecting civil liberties, and strengthening, strengthening the legislative branch. He is a nationally recognized expert on federal transparency, accountability, and congressional capacity. Daniel was instrumental in drafting and enacting legislation, including the Data Act, FOIA modernization, public access to CRS reports, publication of legislative information as data, obtaining a study on restarting the Office of Technology Assessment, and dozens of House rule changes, including the creation of the Office of Whistleblower Ombudsman. I did not know that, Daniel. Uh, Daniel previously worked as a policy director at CRU, Policy Council at the Sunlight Foundation, and as a legislative attorney with the Congressional Research Service. And Daniel graduated cum laude from Emory University School of Law. Welcome, Daniel. Uh, Mike uh, Listener is Executive Director and CTO of the Free Law Project, which he co-founded in 2013 as a nonprofit dedicated to making the legal system more competitive and fair, and whose mission is to provide free access to primary legal materials, developing legal research tools, and supporting academic research on legal corpora. In this role, Mike works with researchers, journalists, individuals, and organizations to improve and interpret the legal system. Prior to starting the Free Law Project, Mike was a student at the School of Information at University of California, Berkeley, where he created the first version of courtlistener.com as his capstone project, and where he focused on technology, law, and policy. So welcome to Mike. Uh, we have agreed that Daniel will go first, Mike will present second, and committee members, please hold your questions until both Daniel and Mike have presented, um, at which time you will have plenty of opportunity to ask questions, make comments, uh, everything you want. Um, so with that, um, over to you first, Daniel. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Good morning to everyone. It's good to see so many familiar faces, um, or mostly familiar. It's been a while since I've seen most of you in person. Um, so the thing that I want to test immediately is just to make sure, is it possible to advance to the next slide? Excellent. See, everything is, come, is working now. Uh, so first promise that I will make to all of you is that I will not be reading my slides. These are intended largely as footnotes. Uh, and reference materials. Um, the presentation that I'm going to give, I'm going to try to keep it as short as humanly possible because your questions will always be much more interesting uh, than what it is that I would have to say. Um, but what I'll be covering in the presentation is the following. Uh, so, and some of these are things that you know, but like it, it, it's useful to have a foundation for it. One is what is the legislative branch? How does disclosure and transparency work inside the legislative branch? what exactly is disclosed inside the legislative branch, and then various mechanisms to improve it. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? As promised, uh, we're moving quickly through the slides, and there's not that many. And I promise I will not read this to you. So the legislative branch is more than Congress. I do have to read the title, right? So uh, the legislative branch is about $5 billion uh, annual appropriation. It has somewhere in the vicinity of 20,000 employees. It's much more than the House and the Senate, and people don't usually think about it that way. Um, and when I think about it, I try to break it down into a couple of categories. So there's the political parts of the House and the Senate. This is what most people usually think of. So this is the personal offices, the committees, and the leadership. It's the parties to some extent. Uh, this is the political side of the House. But there's also support offices uh, inside the House and the Senate as well. I've listed a bunch of them. There's even more. These are the folks who keep the lights on. These are the folks who uh, move the legislation. These are the folks who keep the IT operating. This is places like the whistleblower ombuds or the people who update uh, the law in the Office of Law Revision Council. This is the, they're still some, they can be political, but they're not necessarily political and they're much less political than the elected officials. 
In addition to the support offices, there are a bunch of support agencies. There's about a half dozen of them. This is where most of the money actually goes. And these you're probably familiar with to some extent. Some of these you've heard of, some of you may have not. Places like the Library of Congress, GPO, the Congressional Budget Office, the Architect of the Capitol, and so on and so forth. And then there's a bunch of sort of miscellaneous other stuff. And it's not real, they're not the way that you would think of as an agency. There's something else. These can be commissions or joint committees. Um, there's a foreign relations component. There's the Office of Detaining Physicians. So there's a bunch of like weird other stuff, these weird commissions that also exist in our situation inside the legislative branch. Uh, next slide, please. So Congress and the legislative branch is very different from the executive branch in a number of interesting ways. One is that Congress is inherently political. It is concerned about its reputation, and it writes its own rules. And this is very different from much of the way the executive branch functions. Uh, there's nobody in charge inside the legislative branch. There's no central authority. There's no rulemaking entity. There's nobody at the top. There are people who are relevant, um, but there isn't an entity that comes together where you can sort of make a decision about things in a certain type of way. Uh, the components inside, particularly the political components, uh, have independence as their hallmark. You largely can't tell the personal committee and leadership offices what to do. They can do largely what they want within a series of constraints. The, they view themselves as sort of being 535 individual offices, not as being the House and being the Senate. Uh, so they can largely set their own processes and procedures. Much of Congress's work is proactively disclosed. They proactively disclose a lot more than you would think. Um, and their work that they're disclosing oftentimes is both predecisional and it's deliberative. If you think about the FOIA carve-outs, right, this is kind of the inverse of what you see elsewhere. Uh, again, the decision would be the enactment of a law. So predecisional, all the conversation around the bills and the amendments and about who's doing what, that is inherently deliberative and that's inherently predecisional. We don't think about it that way, but that, that really is what it is. And finally, while there's a number of executive branch, uh, a number of laws, many of these laws do not apply to Congress or they don't apply to Congress in the same way that they might apply elsewhere. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna read this to you, but um, there's many sources of rules and ways for Congress or its components to change how it operates. Many of these things don't require passing a law. Some of it can be just as simple as like you change the way you operate. Some of it could be a rule change. It could be appropriation language. There's a lot of vehicles. There's a lot of points of entry into the legislative branch to change the way that it or its components function. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, it's important to think about the different types of congressional disclosure that take place. Um, and the emphasis on the kind of disclosure that happens is different than exists elsewhere. So I have made up basically six categories. Other people probably have a more uh, appropriate hierarchy, but this is the way that I think about it. There's the mandatory proactive disclosure. So uh, you, have to, you get to see all the bill text. You get to see the committee reports for the most part. You get to see all the enacted laws. There's laws around lobbying. So there's all these things that they have to disclose and they do it without being asked to do so. They require themselves to do it. There are a number of things that are voluntary disclosure. Press statements, unintroduced bills, um, personal office websites. When you write them a letter and they write you a back, this is voluntary proactive. They don't have to do it, but they, but they choose to do it. There is a very small category of mandatory responsive stuff. So FOIA is for the Copyright Office. Uh, FOIAs for older records at the National Archives. There's a handful of things that are mandatory responsive that are enforced by third parties like the courts, but there's not very many. There's a lot of voluntary responsive stuff, though. So these are like, you know, a member of the press calls and you get an answer, introduce, introduce draft bill text, there's member schedules, all the tweeting and all the letters, some of their scheduling, this is all like things they don't have to do, but they do as a matter of course. Now, there's some other weird categories of things. One is what I call quasi-mandatory responsive. I'm sure there's a much better way to describe this. But basically, inside some of the support offices and agencies, some of the support agencies, they have instituted a FOIA life, or FOIA life, depending on how you like to say it, process. So, for example, 
you can make a FOIA-like request of the GAO. They promulgated regulations. They will consider your request. They follow a series of rules and regulations, and they'll put it up. You, know, you can't vindicate it in court, but they have that. The Library of Congress has it. Um, there was a requirement that we got in the last year's appropriations both for the Capitol Police to um, uh, sort of consider applying FOIA to its stuff. This is being imposed on them. This would be a FOIA-like process because, again, you can't go to court. If you're appealing it, you're appealing to their general counsel, so it's not really, you know, uh, 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 you know, a review, you know, sort of from a blank slate. But, but that does kind of exist. Uh, and then there's um, involuntary disclosures. Involuntary disclosures, I, I, there's probably a better way to describe this, but this is how I think of it. So these are things that can be disclosures by third parties. So let's say that I'm a member of Congress and I send a letter to all other members of Congress. One of the other members of, the, of Congress discloses that to the public. That's disclosure by a third party. That's involuntary disclosure of the letter that was sent by the original member. Press coverage, of course, is involuntary disclosure. Every time you see scoop for something that's not public, maybe it was being voluntarily disclosed or maybe they found it out. You can do, you can do uh, involuntary disclosure around the legislative branch by deploying the executive branch for communications that they receive from Congress. And the final, and this is the really a big category and people don't think about it a lot, are paid services. So if you want CRS reports, well, they're now required to be disclosed, generally speaking, but until recently they weren't. But you could go to Lexis or Westlaw and you could pay for it. You can get all the committee reports from the 1790s forward online in a digital format. That is, that, you know, some of it were non-published documents. That's involuntary disclosure. Um, information about contact information for the members is a voluntary disclosure. They don't really disclose this, or at least not in the way that you would think. So there are services that go and um, will basically build giant databases to disclose a lot of the information about Congress. Uh, and of course, um, you know, this is the way that I think about it. There may be other categories, but hopefully this makes sense. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not going too fast, right? Is this good? Excellent. Okay. Um, so when you want to think about enhancing legislative branch transparency, assuming that's something that you want to think about, here's some of the lessons or, or that I've learned or some rules of thumb for thinking about this. One is that the further an entity is away from playing a deliberative role that is politically sensitive, the more appropriate it probably is to apply FOIA or a FOIA-like remedy. So the Capitol Police is a security force. They're like most other law enforcement. They're like the FBI or the ATF. They're security. They're not police, although we call them police. FOIA makes sense to apply to them in some fashion. The Congressional Budget Office or the Government Publishing Office, the Government Accountability Office, some of their stuff is deliberative and eternal, but a lot of their stuff you can FOIA for it or FOIA-like process because it's further away. So if you want to get the emails of a member of Congress to another member of Congress, if you want to get a confidential report from the Congressional Research Service to an office, that's really close to the deliberative role, and that becomes a very different question than um, uh, how many traffic stops did you do in the last year? Or uh, how much money did you spend on producing budget, you know, budget explanations or whatever it might be? In Congress, uh, bright lines are best. Uh, they do really well with all of these things need to be disclosed or none of these things need to be disclosed. And you can deal with voluntary for some of those, for the other things. But proactive disclosure works better for them. So, like, requiring them to disclose a category of stuff works much better than having some sort of a weighing or a balancing test. So all CRS reports, all letters from agencies to Congress that are required by law, like that is clean. As you get, as it gets murkier, it becomes harder to make it work because who is going to adjudicate the determination of what congressional information should be publicly available? Uh, the idea of having someone sort of rooting through their files is not something that will be politically sustainable. Uh, and it's probably not a great idea uh, in certain circumstances. And they also are significantly woefully understaffed, so they probably couldn't do it even if they wanted to. I would say that if you can buy the information from a third party, then the legislative branch should be proactively disclosing it instead. Why are we making people rich who are basically repackaging legislative information and reselling it? It's great if you want to go and provide analytics on top. That is a value add. That is a great business model. But faster access to a bill? Everybody should have equal access to legislation at the same time. Congress should be in that business. 
Second, if it is being disclosed, they should probably be disclosing it as much as possible as data. There are huge industries built around transforming PDFs into useful information. If they're going to create their own information, they might as well make it as valuable and as data enriched as humanly possible. Uh, sort of two other points here, and I'm going to skip one. One is that archiving and access to records is inconsistent in the legislative branch. For example, committee records go to NARA. Personal office records, you can burn them in the backyard barbecue. Like, that's, that's just what it is. Uh, there are historians, there are some archivists, but they don't think about archiving as a general rule. They don't, uh, certainly, in the, certainly inside the House and Senate itself, they don't think about it that way. Uh, they don't set up record systems. There's not systems of records and management and all the stuff that we do. Like, that doesn't really exist for them. So it's really haphazard. And Congress is very bad at dealing with classified information. Of course, Congress can't classify information itself. It's all derivative. It's secondary stuff that comes from the executive branch. But they don't have a process to release it, generally speaking, unless they go and pass a bespoke law. The ICU has, like, a great report from maybe 15 years ago that talks about when Congress has decided to direct records that it has to be disclosed that are classified, but they really don't have a way of dealing with this that's very good. Uh, next slide. So it was suggested that it might be helpful to have some recommendations for legislative branch transparency and to help you think about through them what's easier, what's kind of hard, and what's like hard, hard to do. So I, I, I put a couple examples here just as ways of helping you to think it through. Uh, so some easier, and nothing is ever easy, but like easier things that like make more conceptual sense are things like releasing legislative branch inspector general reports. We do this for the executive branch for the 74 IGs. They're on oversight.gov. As a general rule, most of these things could probably be, there are six IGs inside the legislative branch. Most of them could have proactive disclosure requirements. You release the report. You can't release the report. You release the summary. Uh, and if it's classified, you follow the GAO model, which works really well. We have current CRS reports publicly available. Well, there's no reason not to publish the historic ones. There's no reason not to publish the current ones as data, as HTML, which we make available internally but not externally. This is just foot dragging on the part of certain folks over there. Uh, there are things like the serial test. This is the volumes of committee hearings and proceedings and laws that were enacted that are basically, until very recently, only available as print. Now they're available as PDF. But they're these giant PDFs. We should be retyping and making them as available as data. Those are easier to do. Sort of intermediate are creating the FOIA-like processes for the legislative branch agencies. We just had that happen with the Capitol Police. They're supposed to do this. How they do it, how well they do it, what it looks like, what's the appeal, you know, who knows. But, like, in, that is doable. That has happened previously. It is possible to push that. Uh, things around, like, witness demographic or disclosing conflicts of interest, that information is gathered, but it's gathered poorly. So having it as data, not as paper, having it all in one place, these are things that are possible to aggregate and disclose so it becomes useful. Uh, also harder, but intermediate, but not too hard, are like historians and archivists to support the committee process. This is a money question. Congress underfunds itself, so like money is hard, but setting up appropriate systems of records, central databases, and all this stuff is totally doable but they have to have the political will. Harder to do, examples, just very quickly, alleged branch declassification office, right? We, we've had this, the, um, Harry, uh, Harry Truman, when he was in the Senate, oh, Lyndon Johnson, when he was in the Senate, had set up a process where um, uh, hearings that he were having that were classified, they were immediately declassified, reviewed, and published the same day. We can do this, but it's harder to do because the executive branch freaks out about uh, classified material like, no, 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 you can't do it, even though, like, it, they certainly could. Centralizing reports and letters to and from Congress is hard. Uh, creating things that facilitate these processes are hard. So things like uh, creating a data coordination office inside the legislative branch because it spans so many things. Worth doing, essential to do, very hard to do. And the final thing that is really hard to do is to add context. Because when you help people understand what's actually happening, it has political consequences and ramifications. So summarizing the bill, well, that, you know, well, there's lots of different ways to summarize it. That can, that can cause interesting reactions. Uh, explaining appropriations language, like all of these things, the more that you have real-time information about what's going on connecting the pieces, 
that, those are the types of things that are really hard to do because who decides what it means? And that, that can create political angst. So final slide. That's it. So that, that's, that's, that is Congress in a nutshell. Happy to go more into it. We talk about this every week in our newsletter, the first branch forecast, which focuses on the legislative branch of government transparency if you're interested. And I'm happy to stop talking so that Mike can talk and we can learn more about the courts. So thank you so much. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Mike, over to you. Great. Um, let's just see if we can get the next slide, make sure that's working. Perfect. Um, so my name is Michael Lissner, and um, Alina, thank you so much for that great introduction. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here to um, present to everyone and um, see some faces that I know. Um, I'm from the Free Law Project. We've been working for many years now in, as a nonprofit to try and get content out of the judicial branch. Um, typically, that takes the shape of legal data in particular, you know, um, motion, uh, opinions, things that are happening inside the courts. Um, but along our path, we've also frequently tried to get um, some sort of document from the administrative side of the judicial branch. Um, and it's been interesting to, uh, to have those experiences, and I'm, I'm happy today to be here to share those. Um, I think my, my presentation might have a little bit more of a push uh, than Daniel's, although I think he, or maybe mine's just less subtle. Uh, but my title here is Open the Judicial Branch. Um, and I, I think I'm hopeful that by the end um, you'll, you'll see why I think that's important. Um, as it is currently, it's pretty hard to get almost anything um, aside from the legal documents, and even those are pretty challenging. And um, there's a lot of content that we should be getting so that we can understand it better. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so. I kind of like Daniel, I, I think a good place to start here is to sort of understand, you know, what is in the judicial branch. Um, and there's a little bit more here than I think most people might might realize, um, although it's a pretty sophisticated group here. But, um, you know, it's about 200 courts, um, and that's including the um, district courts, bankruptcy courts, appellate courts, supreme courts. Um, and it's also worth remembering that we have courts sort of around the world. Um, you know, we have courts um, practically in Asia with the, um, with the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, and so there, there's a huge variety of, of how these courts work um, and where they are, and it's an extre extremely distributed system. Um, the next part is the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts. Um, this is the administrative org, um, and there's a lot of these on the state level as well. Um, they often have the same name. And, you know, these are the folks that are making this show work, you know, um, all of the administrative folks. At the top, there's the Judicial Conference of the U.S. Um, this is the policymaking. They meet a uh, policymaking body. It has members of the Supreme Court. It has a number of judges that are on there. Um, they meet twice per year. The meetings are closed to the public, um, and they do release notes about what they talk about, um, but they have subcommittees, of course, uh, that report during their um, biannual meetings, and those subcommittees, you know, minutes, um, and actually even learning the membership of those meetings, uh, they treat that as a secret, um, and so you can't even find out who's on the subcommittees. The next part of the judicial branch is the FJC, the Federal Judicial Center. Um, they're a neat organization. Um, they do trainings for judges. That's one of their biggest things. So when you become a new federal judge, somebody's got to tell you how to do the job, and that's a big part of what they do. Um, they also do research and statistical work for, for the judicial branch. So they actually have an incredible amount of data. Um, and they are one of the bright spots in terms of access to information in the judicial branch. Um, they have a database of all of the cases that are happening um, in every quarter. They, they put it out, and it has metadata about cases. Um, it's pr a pretty incredible source. But um, in keeping with the slightly secretive nature of the branch, um, 
although they have the information about the judge that's in each case, and there's a column for it in the data, that column has been blanked out. Um, it's a policy that the judicial conference itself created. Um, they said, you know what, uh, no judge information in bulk. We're not gonna do that. Um, so although the FJC gets that data, um, they blank it out before giving it to the public. So you can't learn about what individual judges are doing. Um, in bulk, I should say. Um, they also do uh, statistical work, um, and so there are annual reports, um, and those typically come out of the Federal Judicial Center. Um, there's, the, there's 81 um, federal public defender organizations. These are an interesting public-private collaboration um, where in some cases there's an administrative element to this, to providing public defenders to individuals and organizations. And, um, the, they're public, public defenders and they're private public defenders. Um, so it's interesting from that perspective that a lot of the work sort of gets shipped out. Um, I think maybe about you know, 70 or 80% of it there. Um, and that's another 4,000 employees right there. Um, there's the U.S. Sentencing Commission. These are the ones, uh, the people who figure out, you know, what are the, what are the sentences um, for various, um, various things that you found, get found guilty of. Um, and then there's the Supreme Court police um, who, you know, guard the Supreme Court. These are also the folks that, you know, do the call out the oye, oye, oye at the beginning of cases and, and things like that. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So the status quo right now um, is that it's a secretive culture. Um, judges think that this is important. Um, and they, they believe that by, by keeping some degree of, um, of distance, they are able to make more independent decisions um, and, you know, have better uh, adjudication. Um, and, and that culture coming from the judges, in my experience, has transferred over to the administrative side. Um, and I guess I should say, since I haven't said it already, that I think most people are agreed that um, we're not going to start asking for judges' personal papers. Um, we're not going to start asking for, you know, a lot of things that are actually happening in the cases that you can't get already. Um, but on the administrative side, um, you know, in from the um, Supreme Court police, there's, you know, there's a lot of other, from the FJC, there's a lot of other stuff that would probably make sense to have in some sort of public access law. Um, so right now, if you want any, any of that sort of stuff, um, the way to do it is with the common law right of access. Um, and I have done a bunch of research on this, and, and it's just this old approach that says that, yes, um, going back to before, you know, the United States was even a country, we've had this right of access um, that people should be able to ask for stuff. Um, and, you know, looking at the history, it is used for court records um, pretty frequently. Um, and this is your, your way to get contact. Uh, but it is not used on administrative records, at least in any visible way that I was able to find. Um, you know, it's a, it could result in court cases if you're asking for administrative records this way, but it seems like um, to the extent it's happening, it's not resulting in court cases or public commentary of any kind. Um, so it, my observation, it seems like there is this common law right of access, um, but people are not using it to um, gain an understanding of what's happening in the judicial branch. Um, the big thing if you're looking at a common law request is, um, is it a public document? And is the public's need for that information greater than the government's need for privacy? Um, and you'll see there, you know, when people are requesting court information, um, you know, that these sorts of discussions happen a lot. And there is actually a fair amount of case law around that. Um, and, you know, there's actually a guide that um, that's put out by the um, RCFP. Um, and they will, you know, it explains um, in great detail um, where the common law landed um, in each different jurisdiction across the country. Long, long guide. Um, but 
The problem, of course, um, with the common law right of access, we had this before there was FOIA. This was the system before FOIA. And it's ultimately not good enough. There are no timelines. Um, there's no statutes. It doesn't provide any sort of support to the organization. Um, there's no guidelines for it. And it's just sort of a loose system, sort of more of a principle than a system. Um, so that's where things are at now. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight a couple of things that are not well understood currently um, that should be in a, in a functional um, functional democracy. And the first one, I think, is a huge ordeal and a big scandal that we don't know more about it, is the solar wind pack. Um, we know from other sources that Russia has um, hacked into a lot of organizations, many of them government, via solar winds. Um, and we also know from the administrative office of the U.S. courts that um, sealed content was involved in this. And that's all we know. Um, we know that sealed content was maybe sort of probably accessed. We don't know what content, and there's not much of a way to ask. Um, I was able to talk to somebody inside the court system that told me a lot about how bad it was in their particular court, and I tried to get some reporters to follow up on it, and I tried to get some people to talk to reporters, but that's as far as we can go. Um, we should be able to ask um, the judicial branch what's going on with that. Um, the next one here is, um, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more on my next slide, um, but there have been, you know, various allegations with various judges of sexual impropriety. Um, you know, that's, and what's happening inside the judicial branch about this? Um, are there any disciplinary events? Are there any whistleblowers? Are there anything of that sort related to these? Um, we just don't know. We don't know how the courts are handling these sorts of events. Um, and then the third one that's been in the news, if you sort of follow this kind of thing, um, and it's an area where we've been working a lot, is PACER fee skimming. Um, and if you don't know the PACER system, it's how the public accesses court documents. It's a, big complicated system I won't get into, but um, basically everything costs a little bit of money. It's a dime per page, and um, that money is supposed to go to supporting the PACER system itself. Um, but recently in court, um, after a pretty long lawsuit, it was found that some of that money was going into other things where it wasn't supposed to go. Um, and they're still figuring out what to do about that extra money. Um, it's about $40 million a year that was you know, going to places it shouldn't have gone. Um, and it was happening for about 10 years, and people had a feeling it was happening for about 10 years. Um, but it took a really long time to figure that out for real um, and to really get that into the public via court case, um, partly because there's no way to look at the financial documents um, inside the judicial branch. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, and so this slide I just wanted to include um, because when researching this topic, um, I wanted to see, you know, do we, do we need more transparency into the activities of individual judges? And I think even for myself, having worked in this area a long time, I didn't realize how many judicial impeachments there had been. Um, the grand total, I think, is around 30 or 40 impeachments. Um, that I was able to find. Um, and, you know, the reasons go, you know, all the way back to, like, drunkenness. Um, that tended to happen, you know, in the 1800s more, um, to graft, kickbacks, espionage, um, you know, judges doing espionage. It would be nice to have some information about that and see what sorts of um, documents are being written about that topic inside the judicial branch. Um, and there's even worth mentioning, you know, that we have had judges with really bad histories and they're not getting impeached. What's going on there? Um, and, you know, these are 
pretty problematic people in, in some instances. So on to the next slide, please. Um, so the next two slides are the top 10. Um, I've talked to a lot of people in preparation for this, um, for this meeting and to sort of gather more understanding about what a judicial FOIA might look like. Um, and I think there's about 50 things people have sort of suggested. Um, and I'm just going to go through these a little bit quickly. But, um, you know, we talked about disciplinary actions for judges. Um, same thing goes for attorneys with the lower reports. This is all stuff related to personnel and directly to individuals um, that, you know, there's been some allegation of some kind. Um, it's important stuff. Financial records. Um, I think that's a pretty obvious one. People know that one. Contracts as well. Um, the judicial branch, you know, like many branches, it um, has contracts with, the, with various uh, defense providers and um, defense contractors, and it would be great to get those contracts and understand them. Um, the next one, fines and fees levied. Um, what sorts of, you know, how, how is your, what are you, what are you actually levying on people, uh, on organizations? Um, AO court guidance letters. Um, when the administrative office um, wants to encourage the courts to do something, because um, they can't necessarily tell them to do something, um, they will send a guidance letter. Um, we had one of these related to PACER recently, and I'm still trying to get my hands on that to see exactly what it says. Um, but it sure would be nice to know, you know, how the administrative office is. Um, guiding the court. Um, next one, security audits, um, recovery plans, incident reports. We know about solar winds um, because they access the field content. What else is going on um, related to security? Um, and that also, I should mention, covers both um, physical security as well as digital security. So, um, you know, although a lot of the field content is online, um, it's worth thinking about. A lot of it is actually just in the courthouses, and what sort of security is happening there? Um, some of this content has huge national um, security implications. So it's worth thinking about that. Next slide, please. Um, the next one is the SCOTUS uh, public calendar. We have this for the president. You know, would it be reasonable to ask for a public calendar um, for the Supreme Court justices? Um, next one is a simple one I, I sort of touched on earlier, is the Judicial Conference Committee membership um, and minutes. Um, I should say the subcommittee membership, actually, the committee itself you know, but um, it's wild that we do not know and it's treated as a secret um, who these people are. Um, list of judges, past and present. Uh, this is something that I've spent a lot of time trying to get access to is um, who are all the judges that we have ever had, and can we build up a nice database of that um, for research and for investigations and for um, public knowledge in general? Um, this is the kind of thing that the FJC provides in part, um, but they do not provide magistrate judges. Um, magistrate judges do a ton of the work, but it's just not something that's provided. Um, even though it's information that they clearly have and there's no reason not to share it with the public. Um, FJC, the integrated database I talked about earlier that has the blank column with judges, it's just a good example of the kind of thing that you can say, hey, you know what, I know you have this document, please give it to me. Um, and then the last one that I think is worth mentioning here, um, this is something that a reporter I talked to suggested, is we know some of the stuff that we want, um, but, you know, once you get access with FOIA, you can start asking for the next thing. You can start learning what you don't have. Um, and so this is sort of the, you know, you don't know what you don't know problem. And so it's, it's worth, you know, mentioning that as well. Um, and then next slide, please. And so the um, last couple of slides here are sort of talk, talk about, like, you know, maybe provoke some questions from folks here. Um, what do we include or exclude if we do write some sort of public access law? Um, field documents, probably we know the answer there. 
Um, but I bet you there's some corner cases that are worth thinking about. Um, court documents themselves, a lot of those are in PACER and accessible to the public. Some of them are not. Um, trial exhibits, for example, are not in PACER. Uh, if you want those currently, you can ask for them. You might be able to get them. Um, but it would be nice if we had something better than just common law right of access. Um, judicial papers. Um, under what circumstances would you consider those a reasonable thing to ask for? Um, clerk selection criteria. That's something a lot of law school students would kill for. Um, when judges retire, they send a letter to the president typically. Can we get our eyes on that? Um, and then, of course, there's the FISA court that deserves a mention here. How does all of this play out um, in one of the most secretive parts of the entire uh, government? It's worth thinking about um, because any rule that you apply to other courts probably is going to end up applying there as well. Um, and then next slide, please. Um, and then the last couple things, these are some problems that you might run into. Um, I think Daniel hinted at this also. Um, how do you appeal to, how do you appeal rejected requests? Um, you know, are you going to have a panel of judges? Um, if you, you know, request something from the administrative office, it goes to a judge or does it go to a panel? Um, does it go to an administrative group somewhere? Um, how do you solve that sort of problem? Um, and, you know, how close do you get to judicial proceedings and papers? Would you want, some, would you want your law to go? Um, what effect would um, FOIA in the judicial branch have on FOIA oversight that we have it currently? Um, currently, an executive branch FOIA, if denied, it goes to a judge. Are those judges' perspectives going to change if they're also subject to something similar? Um, and then finally, you know, what do you do when someone makes a huge request? Um, if somebody asks for a million documents, what are you going to do? Um, is the judicial branch ready for that kind of request, and does it know um, how to respond? Um, and with that sort of opening up to questions, um, I can go to the last slide, and I'll just say thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here and happy to open things up to conversation. Great. Mike, thank you so much. That was really informative. I took a lot of notes. So um, I just want to open it up to anyone or uh, who wants to start asking questions, engage Daniel and Mike in, um, in conversation. So who wants to go first? Tom is raising his hand very respectfully. And so Swan. Okay. Tom first, Swan second, Cal third. Okay. Uh I think it's really useful to have that last slide on problems to overcome. Uh, and, and so I have sort of two related questions. Um, one is um, you both mentioned the enforcement issue, and, you know, uh, I, I think the history of Congress enforcing uh, against itself is not a very encouraging one, and yet I think the likelihood of Congress allowing the courts uh, a role in enforcement is um, zero, uh, but maybe Daniel could comment on that. And, and without enforcement, uh, is it still worthwhile? The answer is probably so, but that's where I get into the political issue, and that is uh, looking back at FOIA, uh, you know, we all remember the original uh, Lyndon Johnson down at the ranch uh, with a veto statement by, prepared by the Justice Department and only at the last minute talked into signing the bill by his press secretary. And then, of course, Ford did veto the 74 amendments. What, what am I getting at? Uh, the executive branch never really embraced applying FOIA to itself. But, of course, Congress had the power to do that. So uh, are we, is this really a fool's errand for us even to think that Congress will apply some FOIA-like process to itself and likewise, the courts. Uh, uh, you know, are, are we are we wasting our time thinking about that because of the likelihood of that level of uh, self accountability and self discipline is um, uh, is nil? And so, that complicated questions, but a good one. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll start with, so the question is of enforcement. And I, I would say that in the legislative branch context, it depends on who you're enforcing it against. So if you're enforcing it against um, some of the support agencies, I can see that as being reasonable, right? I, I can see, you know, we already have enforcement against the Copyright Office inside the Library of Congress. We have FOIA-like processes inside um, uh, GAO, uh, the Library of Congress, and a couple other places. Um, so, so like they're already doing it to some extent. The question is, who would you appeal to? Um, my, if, if if I were to create this up sort of out of whole cost, like the support agencies, what I would probably do is I would take a page out of the workplace rights model. So. Congress has a similar problem with respect to applying health and safety laws to itself. You, you couldn't go to the Department of Labor uh, or, or outside entities to enforce wage and hour restrictions and how you unionize and all that other type of stuff. So what Congress did was they created the Office of Compliance, now the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights. That is an entity that basically promulgates the regulation that deals with all of the the initial level request, and then uh, at a certain point, you can appeal to the courts depending on what it is. And I think that that may work in the FOIA context. I don't like having agencies being the judge of their own agreement or denial of a request, having something else that sets forth their regulations and uh, that uh, deals with the at least the initial level of, of like appeal out of the agency probably makes sense. So you could imagine I don't, I don't have a cute name for it, but like a congressional FOIA office that's responsible for regulations that applies to certain things. And then you can ultimately maybe appeal it out to, a, you know, a three panel judge in the, in the federal courts or something like that. And so we do have a model for that type of thing. I don't think FOIA is going to be able to get closer to the political side. Uh, I think what you're going to have to do is actually go with the the A section, not the B section of FOIA, you know, where there's the long list of things that you are required to disclose under FOIA. Uh, and I would say that for a long list of things that you must disclose X, Y, and Z, and you, and you have a long list of those things that, that you have to do, just like FOIA has mandatory disclosure in certain sections. And you probably have to think through what enforcement looks like, or you have a coordinate, like the data coordination office that I was talking about that helps uh, agencies sort of, or, or, or entities think through how to implement that for the implementation of, of sort of the A, the FOIA A section. And for the B section, I would have like the, you know, like I said, I would have like a, an entity inside the legislative branch that, that deals with uniform regulations, appeals, and then ultimately you probably have indication to the court. Uh, and how you divide that line, of course, will be a very interesting political question, which I will leave for further discussion. Yeah, I think I would just add to that um, that there's a lot of stuff that um, is not going to be a fight, right? Um, there's, I think there's probably probably rightfully there's a lot of focus on you know the most controversial content and um, what's going to happen with that. But I think um, coming from where we are now with the common law right of access, just having something encoded, you know, just having a law that says exactly um, what the process is. Boy, that would be nice. Um, and for a lot of stuff, you could say, look, here's what I want. Um, please give it to me. And they'll say, sure, no problem. Um, and that'll make a lot of things a lot easier. Um, and I've tried to get content from the judicial branch in the past, and it's hard to even figure out who to ask. Um, and you can spend days making phone calls and emails just to figure out who it is that has the thing you need. Um, and so just having it codify codified would be a huge step forward. Um, for that kind of stuff. Um, I think for, you know, sort of the, on the other side, the stuff that's more controversial or, you know, that the judicial branch doesn't want you to have necessarily. Um, I, I think it, it's worth noting, you know, like in the Pacer case um, where they were accused of doing this skimming, um, it was instructive to see how they talked and thought about themselves. Um, and I think they, they do, Treat it pretty respectfully. Actually, um, they they definitely understood that they were you know ruling about their own behavior, um, 
and how important it was to be impartial in that. Um, so that gives me a little bit of hope. Um, and, you know, I think that you can also use sort of the federated nature of the courts as well to create um, a, you know, a panel of judges that is from, you know, a geographic. And so if you're requesting something from Texas, let's make sure that maybe the judge on that one is on that panel. It's not, you know, the same person. Um, there's a lot of leeway to do that sort of thing. Um, and then the last point I'll just sort of um, throw out there is that um, by codifying something like this, um, you create a clearer story um, when it's denied, right? Um, when your request is denied, the press can talk about that clearly, um, and they can talk about is it outrageous that it was denied? Um, does it violate the law um, that it was denied? Um, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily um, get you the thing you need, but it at least makes the public understand where things are. Okay, Tom, you're good? I'm good. Okay. All right, Tuan, you're up. Uh, my, my question is, I have a comment and then a question. Perhaps on the uh, other side of what Tom was saying pragmatically, Tom was asking the question, uh, you know, is this pragmatic and that would Congress ever agree to this? So mine is the sort of other side of things, assuming for the sake of argument that Congress were willing to adopt this, uh, and let me say that I'm sympathetic with the need for greater transparency and accountability from Congress and the courts. And, and I certainly do think that FOIA's current scope does seem to be transparency for the, but not for me. But, but if Congress were to uh, expand the definition of agency, that it were revised to apply to congressional and judicial agencies, it strikes me that pragmatically we'd have bad effects on the other side. And I think, Michael, you kind of allude to this in the problems in your last slide, I think legislative enthusiasm for strengthening FOIA further and vigorous judicial enforcement would likely both suffer. Um, in the political economy of transparency, in other words, there, there might be a policy trade-off between the horizontal breadth of, of FOIA's uh, scope applying to Congress and, and to the courts now uh, but then it, what would suffer would be the vertical depth of the transparency you could come to expect. Um, and so I guess my question is, have you looked at all to states that have attempted to do this with their little FOIAs such that they've applied them to the courts and the legislatures, like Pennsylvania's right to know law, for example, uh, applies to the courts and, and to uh, their uh, legis legislature? I mean, how, how does it work there? I mean, is it nearly as, as uh, vigorous and thoroughgoing as the FOIA is? Daniel, I don't know if you have something, have thoughts on that. Um, I I haven't had a, any opportunity or I haven't ever found anything about how the, the vertical versus the horizontal um, suffers. Um, I, I think I could offer some you know, thoughts about it, but uh, there's a lot of smart people in here, so. Maybe other types of thoughts as well. Yeah, and, and so I, I've not looked at it at the state level. I've looked at sort of international comparators instead, uh, which is, of course, different uh, systems of government. Um, but I, I don't have I don't have a good answer for you um, in, in terms of the 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 request nature of FOIA. I I I find that in legislative models that. Bright lines and proactive disclosure largely works better than having some sort of an adjudicatory process. Uh, and in those, you know, I mean, there, there's exceptions, um, but but I find that that tends to be better than having a more complicated process. Um, but I don't have enough data points to talk about the state in terms of what works well and what doesn't work well. I, I think the idea of an affirmative disclosure, say a 552A kind of model, as you were mentioning, Daniel, that you know that seems like a, a good idea for at the, even if it doesn't have enforcement teeth, at the very least, a hortatory sort of you know this is what you ought to be disclosing is what the law actually says, and it would allow uh, you know partisans in Congress to call out uh, you know the opposition for failing 
to bring something forward, and that creates political pressure that can help get these things released. It's the 552B stuff that I'm a little bit more uh, skeptical of, sort of the, uh, or the, uh, excuse me, the, uh, you, you know, the responsive uh, kind of here's my request model. Um, I, you know, I, I might say that one way that would be maybe better is, is that if, if this weren't tied to FOIA, if it were a separate statute, uh, in such that, um, you know, Congress could continue to sort of be enthusiastic about FOIA and, and the courts also, um, you know, I do worry if, uh, if the fates of Congress and the courts are tied up with FOIA, uh, that what we'll see is FOIA suffer. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and that's something that um, some of the conversations I had is like, don't use the word FOIA. Uh, let's not call it FOIA. Let's call it a public access law, um, or you know, some, something like that. And let's let's not intermingle them um, because it's not it's FOIA, and probably trying to shoehorn one into the other will create these sorts of um, these sorts of uh, complications, I guess. Okay. Tom, thanks very much. Are you good? Okay. Uh, Kel, I believe you're next. And then I've got Jason and Allison in that order. Hi. So I have a question mostly for Daniel, but um, it'll, it'll be uh, interesting to hear Mike's viewpoint of this as well, coming from a different perspective. Congress and the congressional agencies tend to have a lot of overlap. And, and sort of in, intermingling to the degree that a lot of uh, the executive branch really doesn't have. And so, for instance, you know, many – some members of Congress believe that any GAO product that's created in response to something they asked for is their legislative product or that, you know, the Capitol Police uh, so, might say that, well, we don't make decisions because the Capitol Police Board – that's made up by the sergeants of arms, sergeants at arms, and the architect of the capital uh, really control things. And so, uh, how would you suggest that we deal with this if we're going to try and make sort of certain components subject to something, a, 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 an open record type process? You know, how would we address this sort of intermingling when you would have maybe one component that doesn't, that isn't subject to it, and one component that is a subject to it, and they sort of work hand in hand and are fuzzy with no really clear uh, lines between them to get things that everybody, at least in the public, would view as important. Like, you know, in, 20, in 2019, good example, in 2019, there was a Capitol Police Inspector General report that said the Capitol has security problems, and if it were ever invaded, it would have problems, and we're having trouble uh, balancing the need for security with the need for sort of openness and security. This is a very tightly held thing. This is something that I'm sure everybody would be interested in reading now in 2021, but even going after it now you know, would, who would you go to? Is it a product of Congress? Is it a product of the Capitol Police? Is it a product of the Capitol Police Board? How do you deal with this kind of intermingled nature of congressional entities? So I, I think you're raising two questions uh, with that. One question is sort of the nature of the thing, and the qu second question I think is who holds it? Like, we run to the second, like, the provenance is, is, like, we run to this in the classified space a lot. Like, whose document is it? So let me, let me take them sort of in part. The first one is, the, the question I would ask is, it individualized legislative advice that is intended and understood to be confidential? So I was an attorney with the Congressional Research Service. And when a member office would call me and ask for advice on a particular matter, and I gave them that advice, that is confidential. You don't get it, right? That should never be made publicly available unless the member office makes that determination. I also wrote CRS reports that were available on a website that any of 10,000 staffers could access. That's ridiculous. That should be publicly available, right? It's not individualized 
confidential advice um, re relating to a legislative matter. Uh, GAO publishes all the reports. The reports that they don't publish, they list their classified reports on their website and they helpfully tell you how to go FOIA. So like that is the model. That is a great model. It works well. They have a dedicate, they know that transparency and accountability go hand in hand and that if you want to have government function properly, you need to have both. Uh, the Library of Congress doesn't really get that, right? So their FOIA implementation is iffy. In their Congressional Research Service, where I used to work, they hate this stuff um, because of their institutional perspective, and they fought, they fight it even when it's things like the plain language description of legislation that's available on Congress.gov. So, like those types of so that's bizarro land. Like that's not acceptable. The second question of like, well, who gets to release the document? Who owns it? The answer is whoever has it owns it. We shouldn't be playing provenance games, right? If I write, if I write a dear colleague letter and I send it to you, Kel, because Kel, you're a member of Congress, you can release it. Now there might be a political consequence for you releasing it, although no one's going to really know that you did it. Um, but if you have it, it's yours. If I give it, if I'm a government employee and I give a document to a journalist, the journalist has it, and that's the end. I mean, that's the end of that story. Like that's just that's the way that works. There may be consequences for the person who turns it over, but like once it's out, it's out. And I think that trying to be like, well, this is a CRS report or this is a committee document or this is a blog, oh, that's not, it, in the legislative context, generally speaking, that's not a thing. There may be political consequences for doing so. So if I am on the Judiciary Committee and the Judiciary Committee staff write me a staff memo and I publish it on my website where I leak it, like that's a problem. But that's a political problem. Um, that's less of a, that's, that's not a, a, a sort of disclosure release problem. And, and people will adapt to the circumstances in terms of how they can, like, where you draw that line will change the way their practices operate so they can make a determination of what they want to keep secret and what they can't. Um, actually, I did want to, if, I, if it's okay, Kelly, I want to pose, just to go back to one final sort of point uh, that, that Tom had raised. Um, so one of the weird things, and, and I mentioned this because it's very relevant to some of the folks participating in this group, are committee records. Committee records after 20 years in the Senate and 30 years in the House go over to the Center for Legislative Archives where you can then go and, and FOIA. Prior to that point, the Center for Legislative Archives will give it to you, but only if you have the permission of the relevant committee. Um, but that, that doesn't make any, committees aren't continuing entities in the House. It could be a Democratic committee or a Republican committee that changes over time. All the members could be gone. It could be 15 years later. And committees don't have a point of contact or a process that you can ask. So by way of example, I was looking for a list of everybody who worked in the White House in 1999 or 2000, which is an annual report that's sent from the White House to Congress. I tried going to the Presidential Library. The Presidential Libraries have lost it. Fine. I tried going to the Congressional Committee that received it, went to NARA. NARA was very helpful and thoughtful, but they said, as is not unreasonable, you need to get the permission of the relevant committee. And the committee had no idea what this process was. They'd never heard of it. And they didn't want to extend themselves to provide these documents to me because this isn't something that they usually do. Um, and so when we think about how to design this, we need to, all, we need to be thinking about the request systems as well and not just like the right. So the committee has the authorization to go and release the document, but they were afraid to do so because they hadn't done it before and there wasn't a point of contact and so on and so forth. So we need to think through, you know, not just see how this is response to two points, not just like what the thing is and who owns it, but, but the request mechanism uh, as well. So ho hopefully that's, that's helpful to your question. It, it is, and you bring up an interesting point with the legislative archives. The same, you, you held up the GAO FOIA process, uh, or the FOIA-ish process, the, the internal regulation, as an example, but they do the same thing, where they're, they'll release their reports, but if you say you want their file that went into creation of this report, they say we won't give it to you without the permission of the person who requested the report, 20 years ago, 
and you run into the same problem. And so and that's sort of the needle that I'm trying to figure out how to thread. Like, I agree with you that it shouldn't matter, but GAO and Congress don't appear to agree with you. And so how how do we address the concerns of, yeah, you know, whoever – how do we convince Congress that Daniel Schumann is right and whoever has – Physical custody of a report, whether it be the U.S. Capitol Police Inspector General or GAO, can release it. But, so I still think this works within the first framework that I described, although you might disagree. Um, GAO, when given documents in a responsive nature, right, like not through subpoena, but just sort of here you go for your investigation, just Congress directed, it is a private, confidential communication that relates to legislative activity. So um, GAO's conduct of the investigation, when they're investigating whatever entity that gives them the response of documents, that's done for, the, for a legislative purpose, done on a confidential basis, and in sort of in that space. So I would distinguish that. Like, I, I think that that is different from um, uh, a lot of the other stuff. Um, so the number of arrests by the Capitol Police is not a legislative matter. It's not really confidential, right, either. Like, it, it, it's, it's just fundamentally different. The number of computers they bought uh, is fundamentally different. The number, like, like those are just different from um, I'm doing, a, I'm holding a hearing into solar wind, and I go and I request thousands of documents from all these other folks. Because Congress has an interest and making sure that people either give it stuff voluntarily or comply with its subpoenas. And they're less likely to fight if, if Congress controls, like, that aspect of the release mechanism because it's closely tied up with legislation or oversight. So, I mean, this, this isn't helpful, I think, to your question. But, like, I think the further away you get away from that purely legislative and oversight function that is intended to be confidential, that will be um, – uh, that sort of goes underneath, like, sort of that process, I think the more likely you're going to have a strong argument that FOIA would make sense, in, sense for it. And as you get more into it, um, I wrote a bill because somebody, because a constituent emailed me. No, right? I'm having trouble getting my Social Security check and you, and you call a member's office. No, right? Like, like, like there's a, there's, pri there's like different, for me, at least, I think there's like different valences to those types of those functions. Um, I am sympathetic to where you come from, having filed FOIA requests, FOIA-like requests, on exactly that basis. Um, but I'm not sure that FOIA would be the right process for that. There might be something else that we need to think of that would that would that would work sort of better as you get more closely to sort of the legislative nut. I think you're muted, Elena. Um, I said, Daniel, thank you for that great answer. Kel, are you good? I'm good. I mean, Daniel and I could carry on like this for two or three hours. So well, let, let's move on okay. to somebody else. Yeah. So I believe Jason is up next. Jason Carter. Jason. Jason Carter for Associates Incorporated. Um, Daniel, Michael, thank you very much for your interesting conversation. Um, I want to focus in on, again on um, the historical records. I'm a historian, um, and Daniel, you mentioned that that member records for for members of Congress could be burned, and I think it was the backyard barbecue was the comment. Um, you know, ultimately, my understanding is the records created in a senator's or a house office that's their property, their records, um, which is the way it is. Um, but that also means that a lot of the records go to universities and various various places all over the country where scholars use them and have access to them um, because they're you know they're they're localized in a way that they're not localized when they're at the Center for Legislative Archives. So that's that's my first comment. Second comment or second question is House Rule Seven and how and Senate Rule Four Seventy Four, which which essentially sets when they are open. Um, I think it, it's 20 and, and 30 and 20 years. Um, 
the the provision for excuse me we have some neighbors here um the 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 provision for that is actually held over when the records go into the center for legislative archives so NARA has essentially acquiesced and said we're going to take these records we understand that records are still owned by members of congress and we're going to keep them separate for these you know 20 or, or 30 years so I, I guess the question is and this goes back to, to tom's comment is you know, it was maybe the stepping stone narrower and saying, hey, look, we're not going to accept these records if they're not actually subject to the provision of FOIA like all other records that are housed in the National Archives. So I just, I, I opened that up, but very interesting conversation. And, and apologies for the neighbor's kids that yes. it in. Yeah. Not, not to worry with the neighbors. So I, and, and I hope you jump in if I, if I miss mm -hmm. parts of this. And of course, I'm sure you're more familiar than I am, although I've attended a number of meetings for the Advisory Committee on the Records of Congress, uh, which is the entity that meets twice a year. For, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, a large historians, I actually was really interested in getting non-historians on it because it'd be interesting to talk about from a data perspective. Um, let me take your second question first. The second question is, about NARA holding the records. Well, NARA's not the only place that does it. Like, GPO does that as well. A lot of the classified records will go over to the government publishing office. Congress literally doesn't have the physical space. And I don't mind, particularly when committees turn over, having a safe place for the committee records to go. I think that that, like, that doesn't concern me. I don't like the 20 and 30 years. I think that that's unreasonable. I think it should be shorter. I think that the greater period of time, I think it's 50 years, although some you guys are probably the only people on the planet who would know better than I do whether it's 50 years for classified material. Um, but it's a much longer period for classified matters than for unclassified matters uh, without even looking at whether they're even properly classified, which is a whole other question that you guys could probably talk about a lot better than I could. Um, but I don't, I don't mind having expert archivists holding on to congressional records. I, that, like, that's not offensive to me. I think that's fine. Uh, and I think I would actually rather have archivists and historians and, and, and records management folks in there the, the day that a member opens up their office. Like, the second they start, they should already be designing their systems so that it's preserved and retained and managed in a way that is useful both for them and how they run their offices and then for keeping it afterward. So, like, that is actually how I if, – if I were running the world – uh, which I guess would obviate the need for a Congress and thus this conversation. But let, if I were running this part of the world, um, I would probably do that that way. Um, the other, the other, it was both a point and a comment that you made had to do with the personal office records. Now, whether they're public or not is a decision, right? And that is a decision that the House and the Senate each in their own rules can change. I think this was true for committee records for a long time that you could also burn them as well, and, I, and, that's, and that hasn't been true for a while. But I, I don't remember the details of that, so I might not be, might, might not be right. Um, and there, is, there have been concerns about commingling of personal committee records such that committee records end up in the personal office and thus end up in the Barbie, which is probably not what you want. Um, there is value, I think, in uh, how members, is it accession, is that the right word, how they provide their records to local universities. But they can also go through them and burn them or parts of them. They can withhold them on bases that have to do with embarrassment, that have to do with other things that are not necessarily relevant. A number of members just toss their stuff or things get sort of lost in the process. I do think that there is value in having materials available around the country, but it also makes it hard to get access. Um, but more and more congressional records are, being, are born digital records. So the, the, the federated nature of the way these things are sort of being created suggests that there may be value in having more of an overarching system for um, making sure that they're digitized, making sure they're properly cataloged, having similar cataloging standards, having a federated search engine so that you can, if I'm looking for a particular document, uh, like the subcommittee prints that I've got behind me, like, I don't know who's got it, but someone probably has it, and it's hard to find. And looking in World Cat's not going to necessarily get you there. So thinking through, like, on a going forward basis, what do you do with these foreign digital records? How do you make sure that everything sort of flows together? What assistance do you provide to people as they question it to their 
to their local university or to something else, like I think that would probably be something that makes sense. And I suspect that Mike probably has similar thoughts with respect to judicial papers because it's going to be the exact same kind of problem in terms of what judges do with, with their stuff. Uh, I'm not aware of an advisor committee on the records of the judiciary, um, although there may be such a thing. Um, but, but, but they do beg similar questions around chamber records as you do for individual member of Congress records. Yeah, um, I have not heard, I, I have not looked into what happens to those records um, long term, maybe, you know, I don't, I have not heard of them going to universities, so I, I'm guessing it's mostly just the Barbie. All right, well, thanks for that, uh, Daniel and Mike. Uh, Jason, you're good? Yeah, I, I, I guess I would, I would say that one of the challenges, and you mentioned what you know, the creation of the records once once members first enter Congress and their thoughts on where their records should go. Um, and again, my my understanding is that some some members of Congress are thoughtful from the very beginning. I think probably most members of Congress would like their papers to go to some university or repository in their um, in their their locale and their where they live. Um, I think one of the challenges, the real world challenges they face is that they're given a very short amount of time to clear their offices. If the election, you know, the election is November 7th, they've lost, they may need to be out of those offices by early December. Um, and perhaps letting the records, you know, be temporarily preserved at a federal record center may help. Um, you know, and that's again just kind of tangential information that I've, I've heard over time. Um, but I, you know, again, I think the stepping stone, you know, you, 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 to try to push Congress to, to do some type of FOIA process or, or procedure, one stepping stone, at least for me, is again the role that NARA plays right now through the Center for Legislative Archives, which is a terrific repository, terrific archivist there. That said, they're, they're being housed in error. Everything else in error follows FOIA. Um, there's an exception for these records. That, to me, is a, is, a, is, a, is a stress point or a push point. So very, very interesting. Thank you for, for, briefing, for briefing us on this, Daniel and Michael. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just one sort of final point. So it, it's not just, you know, when, when members lose their election, they've got weeks. Like, they have to be out of their office in, like, two weeks. Like, they, they come in, they end up in, like, cubicles for their last month in Congress that are set up in the cafeteria. And then if a member dies, which happens not infrequently, um, then, there, then, like, you know, the court comes in and takes over, but, like, what happens then? So there's, there are real, and particularly when you look at the Senate, where a lot of them sort of, like, stay there and, 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 and uh, expire there. I, I don't know a delicate way to say it. Like, they, they tend to die in office uh, more frequently than one would expect. Um, although they have a better archival support process, uh, they may just not be ready. And the House members in particular, they're just not ready. Like, they don't – it is never a priority for them um, to do the historian archival stuff. Like, they just it's, – it's never – it's not really supported in the way that they needed, and it's just not what they do. Uh, I mean, they may think about it afterward, um, but 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 there is like this is where more support could help streamline that process because it really is it can it's as you mentioned it like the, your mileage will very much vary depending on the number. Okay, all right. Thanks for that, Daniel. Jason, you're good. Yes, thank you. All right, so we've got about five minutes. We're running a little bit over, but I know we have a little wiggle room in our agenda. We've got about five minutes left. Allison, I know, has a question, so I will not deprive you of that opportunity, so please take it away. Thanks, Selena. Questions mostly for Daniel. Um, Michael, feel free to chime in, too, but it's more if something like FOIA were to be uh, instituted in Congress and um, in the judicial branch, what do you see that interplay between the different branches looking like? Like currently, most of the congressional communications to an executive branch are subject to FOIA unless they're marked as congressional records and then exempt from FOIA. Do you see some sort of reciprocity with certain executive branch records or the executive branch maybe being able to assert 
some more deliberative process or other privileges that they would provide the information to the Hill, but the Hill would be under obligation not to release it to the public, maybe similar to what the GAO does. What are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so like the marking as a congressional record is not something that I would respect as being exempt from FOIA to begin with. So like that, that, that probably puts me uh, in variance with, uh, at variance with what some of the uh, uh, former committee chairs would say. Um, I think that it creates an, a push to limit FOIA. I think that, that if you do it in the same regime, it creates problems. Um, this is why I tend to favor um, uh, more like straightforward proactive disclosure requirements uh, as opposed to sort of the, the balancing questions where it's categories of stuff. So like one bill that I'm working on right now and I've been working on for a decade is a law that would require all mandated reports to Congress to be publicly available. Um, and there's a, there's a carve out in it, which is that it puts it through the FOIA process so that like there is an actual, so that the agencies would, would be, would basically redact it in accordance with FOIA for what, for what is released. So like I'm trying to have a separate law that is a clear application that applies to executive branch materials, but also is respectful of, of some of the decisions that we've made in terms of, of uh, what's disclosed and what's released. Um, I don't have a problem with communications from Congress to the executive branch uh, being employed in the executive branch. Like, I think that that is a fine thing. Um, in the reverse, I don't have a problem with either. With communication, you know, like, it, it doesn't, this doesn't seem, a, it, it seems inequitable, but it doesn't seem unjust, right? I, I don't mind necessarily that mechanism. I, I think where it gets weirder, I mean, this all stuff is weird, but like where it gets weirder is um, I am in a senator's office and I've heard that this support agency isn't properly protecting records. And I write them a letter and I say, hey guys, you're outside the firewall and you're gonna get the stuff stolen by a foreign, you know, foreign adversary. Is that deliberative? I don't think so. It's not classified because they can't really classify stuff except under the Atomic Energy Act, and that doesn't really apply. I mean, it, that's where things start to get weirder, and I don't know how you deal with those cases. But much of my career, for what it's worth, has been here is a simple, straightforward, obvious example of something that should be publicly available. CRS reports should be publicly available. All bills, summaries, stats, information should be publicly available. That range of stuff and like just like picking off pieces of things that are like either inherently obvious or that congressional offices need and they can't get access to. Because FOIA, you should remember, and, and transparency, and I know you guys remember, it's not just about the public and it's not just about historians. It's about the person who's sitting next to you. It's about the person in your office. It's about the next office over. We have huge problems where agencies send reports to Congress, for example, that goes to staff for A, and the person sitting next to them never sees it, and when staff for A leaves, it's gone. There's a records-keeping problem that we're using trans public transparency as a mechanism to fix. The same thing with, like, their terrible technology. They have all these dear colleagues that are awful. You can't go through all of them, but if they become publicly disclosed, someone can build a better system so you can find what you're looking for. We're using, in many respects, transparency, not just for transparency's sake, as well for public accountability, but to improve the internal availability of information. Um, and that's why I like proactive disclosure, that's why I like the Data Act, that's why I like sort of those things make information available not just to the public stakeholders, but to a lot of the folks inside who need that information as well. Sorry, that was a long-winded diatribe, I will stop. But like, hopefully that was responsive to your, to your question. That's helpful, thank you. If I have time to add one little thing, um, I, yeah, I think one, one other thing I've, that um, many of the comments so far have, have been giving me a lot of consideration of is that, like, there's currently, you know, with oil only applying to some areas, it's kind of like you have someone who, who, who's gabbing in your conversation. Um, and so there's actually a motivation not to share things that would then make that thing subject to FOIA. Um, and that creates friction, um, friction communication, friction in getting things done. Um, 
instead of you know emailing something, you gotta pick up the phone because no one's gonna FOIA your your phone call. Um, and you know by actually bringing uh, public access laws into the government broadly, um, it should create a better economy for sharing information amongst everybody, um, rather than worrying, oh, if I do this thing, you know, then now it's going to be subject to FOIA, and maybe I don't want that. Um, you can actually create a better information by bringing everything out into the open by default, or more things into the open by default, I should say. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Daniel and Michael. This has been really, really fascinating. I think we're all very engaged. Um, lots of information to take in and to think about, and we really appreciate all of your suggestions. Uh, we, I'm sure, will continue to dialogue with you as uh, the subcommittee on legislation looks at these issues. And um, thank you again. We really appreciate it. Um, you're welcome to jump off now. Uh, we're going to move on to the public comment section of our meeting. So, again, we thank you for your participation and time. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you Please for having me. Thank, thank you very much. Right. Okay. So uh, we have now reached the public comments part of our committee meeting. I know I went a little bit over, but I still had a little bit of wiggle room. Didn't want to cut off the great discussion we were having. Um, so we're going to invite non-committee participants who have ideas or comments to share uh, to do so at this time. We post on the FOIA Advisory Committee webpage any written comments we receive, oral comments are captured in the transcript of the meeting, which we'll post as soon as it is available. Uh, we're going to open up our telephone lines. Um, Michelle, if you could please provide instructions again to our listeners for how to ask a question or make a comment via telephone, that would be great. Absolutely, my pleasure. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to make a comment at this time, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. Once again, pressing pound 2 will enter you into the verbal comment queue. All right. Um, I'm just going to ask Martha first, um, do we have any questions or comments that we've received via chat during the course of the meeting? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okie doke. So um, one person on the YouTube chat um, has a question for the classification subcommittee. When do you think the questionnaire is going to be finished and sent? I believe it's the questionnaire regarding Glomar. Uh, yeah, this is Kristen Ellis from the FBI. I, we do not currently have a, uh, an anticipated date when that's going to go out. We are still at the very beginning stages of developing the questionnaire, uh, determining what questions to include, what type of information we're trying to elicit, and identifying the specific agencies that we'll be querying. So um, we may have an update on dates at the next meeting, but right now it's very preliminary. You do. Uh, Mr. Hammond has uh, submitted some questions. Some were things that were in his previously submitted um, comments, which will be posted on our website and will go to the committee, of course. But he was wondering if you could provide a very short update on the status of recommendation number 19. Um, this is the recommendation um, that recommends that Congress engage in more regular and robust oversight of FOIA. And so I think our, our Congress, our Congressional uh, Committee may be able to address this. Sure, this oh, is Kevin Quinnahan. Oh. Go ahead, Tom. The That's actually one of the big uh, reasons that our subcommittee exists. Uh, we have a we, we have a separate working group on how to make OGIS function better, whether it be, you know, giving them more power, giving them more resources, or sort of uh, affecting how agencies interact with them that is undertaking that. But we also have a separate subcommittee on dealing basically how o oversight works, you know, and how we make recommendations for, for how agencies should improve their oversight, or sorry, that uh, Congress should improve its oversight. So that is a big part of our initial mission plan. Now, un unlike most of the other agencies, most of the other subcommittees, we 
do operate on a bit of a six-month schedule as opposed to a two-year plan. Uh, so this may change in June, but the things that we're not done working on, we're going to carry over probably into the next one. But this does mean that we anticipate to have some work done, you know, some movement on actually making concrete uh, legislative proposals for this stuff uh, in the near future, whether it be in three months or six months or nine months. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, from Alex Howard, he asked, are all of the FOIA officers on the committee hosting Sunshine Week events and inviting requesters to participate? If not, why not? So this is Bobby. I think, Alina, you teed this up earlier, um, and uh, uh, DOJ is hosting a public event. Uh, I believe there are other agencies that are doing as well. This is Allison uh, from Commerce. I know at least some of our Sunshine events next or on March Tuesday, March 16th are open to the public. Okay. Uh, we currently have one comment or question in the queue on the phone. So if uh, the caller can go ahead, please, that would be great. Cola, you may go ahead. Your line has been unmuted. Yes, hi, this is uh, Bob Hammond. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I had a couple of follow-on questions for recommendation 19. Those are in the chat. And so maybe you guys could, you know, give me an email or something on those. The, the issue I wanted to spend a little bit of time, and it doesn't look like we have much, were for the technology committee. And I don't know if we have anybody online from uh, EPA. Maybe we can make this more a focus of a future meeting. But EPA has developed really an excellent uh, FOIA portal, uh, but in the implementation there are some drawbacks that really hamper uh, public disclosure. For example, if you were to look for my FOIA requests, first if you look by my name, you'll find that hardly any of them are on there, none from Navy and in public domain. So nobody can search by FOIA requests and the requests themselves are not visible. You talk about sunshine, we, I think sunshine's a great disinfectant, and if the FOIA requests are public and all of the records that go with that, the correspondence and everything, if all of that is publicly available, that would address a number of my issues. Uh, there's no reason for a FOIA request to be private, uh, Muckrock allows them to be embargoed for a period of time. If you're a member of the media, you don't want to give up a scoop. But if FOIA requests a public action, there's no reason for it not to be public. In some cases, agencies are concerned about exposing privacy information. If it's my information, I choose to disclose it. But one of the things that they voice concern about is I expose the names and email addresses of uh, persons who have submitted uh, information to me, and anything that comes from me as a private requester is already in the public domain, so nobody should redact a FOIA request. There's no reason for them to be uh, private. And, and I don't know if we have anybody from EPA, but I had like six, in, six uh, recommendations. I think my email to you only showed five. Another drawback, uh, FOIA Online has a, a capability for communications where the agency can communicate with their requester, they can put the documents in there that they're releasing. That's a good function, but at the outset, the agencies can block that from being used. So you can't submit your follow-ups through there. You can't uh, challenge some of their decisions and all those things through the communications uh, portal. And there are a number of those that I think are pretty good recommendations to make the uh, process really what you all intend it to be. It's, you know, public disclosure, and I know we don't have very much time now, but uh, my question, is there anybody on the line from EPA? Yeah, this is Matt Schwartz from EPA. I can respond to this. Yeah, hey, great, Matt. Thank you. I appreciate your coming, probably on short notice. 
Hi there. No, no, that's fine. Um, so just to clear up, EPA did develop FOIA online, but EPA no longer manages FOIA online. That was passed off to an intergovernmental group uh, a few years ago, um, and they do take public comments. Um, they take those if you email recommendations to the help desk. There's a, an email address on the FOIA online landing page. They consider those, um, and there are regular updates done to FOIA online and those go to this intergovernmental committee. So EPA actually doesn't manage FOIA online, online anymore, but I encourage you to send those to the help desk. Well, I've done that, and I haven't gotten any response. And when I submitted a FOIA request to see who was on the committee, uh, I, I don't have the information as to who's on the committee. That should be public. Is that something that you can provide to me? I'd like to be able to make um, recommendations and be able to engage with the committee to uh, provide perspective if I can. Right. I mean, if it's an active FOIA request, that'll be responded to. But as far as information that goes to FOIA online, I wouldn't have any. Um, EPA doesn't have any hand in that at all anymore, unfortunately. Okay. I'm just trying to find out who's on the committee, like this committee, and, and maybe members of this committee are part of that intergovernmental uh, working group. Uh, might be because you have a technology committee. And if that's the right committee, then I know who to talk to. Um, hi, this is Patricia West with um, National Labor Relations Board. And um, my, my agency is um, one of the FOIA Online um, uh, partner uh, agencies. We, we use FOIA Online as our case management system and to receive and send um, a FOIA request information. Um, so I, I'm on uh, our FOIA online committee with our agency, um, uh, partner agencies. If you want to send the recommendations to me, I'd, I'd be happy to forward them. Yeah, sure. And I don't know if there's a, uh, an opportunity for uh, public comment when you have your meetings and those kind of things. Um, but I'd really appreciate that. Uh, Patricia, is your email in the body of records for today? Um, so oh, everything that you, Mr. Hammond, everything you sent us, we'll be happy to forward on to Patricia. Okay. And otherwise, send it on to FOIA-advisory-committee, and we'll forward it on okay. to Patricia. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen. I, I I tell you that that would be. Uh, I think that I think FOIA online go, would be the gold standard, uh, with just a couple of tweaks to make it uh, transparent uh, and better for the users. Uh, it was a great great application. Thank you so much for your comment, um, Alina. We've got one more uh, that came in through chat. Um, Sean Moulton is um, asking the process subcommittee if they thought about looking into FOIA changes that have been put in place by agencies due to the pandemic and the effect on FOIA processing. Mm -hmm. um, looking for best practices to minimize impacts, you know, the impacts of the, of the COVID uh, outbreak and the need to telework. Uh, we, I, I had not occurred to me. Um, I think that a lot of people have seen an impact. I, I, I think that's a, a question worth fielding in terms of what, you know, what changes people have seen. Um, you know, I, I think there will be some, you know, new, new practices put in place that, um, you know, might be helpful to kind of think about going forward. If you have specific questions you think would be useful to, to flag in us, like on our survey, requester survey, uh, I'd be really interested in those. This is, uh, this is Bobby from DOJ as well. I just wanted to add to that. I and mean, we have done some consideration. I know that the tech company has thought about that as well a little bit, because um, technology is such a big connection to the issues and challenges that um, um, presented it to agencies uh, in the pandemic. But also this month, we are holding a couple best practices with agencies, um, with the CFO Tech uh, Committee and, and uh, OGIS uh, to get some of the best practices and get a better view of the challenges of agencies um, over the past year. It's something that we've been looking closely at. Um, we issued guidance 
pretty early on to agencies uh, to help mitigate the challenges and also ask agencies to report on it in their CFO report. So we're doing a lot of information gathering, a lot of review of what agencies are doing, and gonna be doing a lot of sharing of best practices and strategies that I hope to be able to also publish in a way um, where all agencies can um, benefit from that. So definitely an area that we have a lot of activity on too. Great, Bobby, thank you. Uh, so I know we're at one o'clock, 1.01 p.m. I know most of us have other commitments that we need to move on to. I just want to wrap everything up. Um, thank all the committee members for all the great work you're doing so far. We've already highlighted our Sunshine Week events um, for both the Department of Justice and NARA, so I hope the public will join us for all of those. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Hope everyone and their families remain safe, healthy, and resilient. We will see each other again uh, virtually at our next meeting, Thursday, June 10th, uh, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. So if, are there any other questions from our committee members or any comments or concerns? I'm seeing some shaking of heads no. Okay, uh, it's been a great meeting. Thank you everyone for your attention. Really appreciate all the interactions and uh, we will talk soon. Uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.